Um, I'll introduce them in the order in which they will be speaking. So first of all, John Ewing, who is, as everybody knows, I'm sure, former editor both of the Intelligencer and of the American Mathematical Monthly, and currently the president of Math for America. So John will speak first. Uh, he'll be followed by Seth Cottrell, who's a member of the faculty at New York City College of Technology, a blogger on mathematics and physics, and uh, author of one of the Intelligencer's most downloaded articles, and that will be what he will speak about today. Then Ajmo Bakonin and Christoph uh, Venevesi, both of the University of Java Skyla in Finland. Uh, Ashmo is the Intelligencer's book review editor, and uh, Christoph is the leader of uh, their university's uh, STEAM activities, and it's those activities that um, they will be presenting about today. Um, they'll be followed by Dan Vellman, a uh, member of the faculty at Amherst College, former editor of the Monthly, and past winner of the Intelligencer's Chandler Davis Prize. Then will come Philip Ording, a member of the faculty at Sarah Lawrence and currently an associate editor of the Intelligencer. And the morning's part of the program will uh, be tied up by or finished up by Lisa Goldberg, who's on the faculty at Berkeley and is another author of one of the Intelligencer's most downloaded articles. And that will be what she'll talk about today. So that's the morning. Um, everybody in the morning section will uh, we're going to try our best to keep to 20 minute time slots, 15 minutes for the presentation and then five minutes for Q&A. So if you have a question after any of the talks, like Mark said, you know, raise your hand using the icon or uh, send Mark a message saying you've got a question and he'll uh, and he'll uh, spotlight you, I guess. So um, without any further ado, let me turn this over to John, uh, who will be talking to us on As the World Grew Smaller, the Early Vision for the Mathematical Intelligencer. So let me get my um, screen share up here, if I can find it. So it's a green button. Yeah, no, I've, I've got the the, the button here, what I don't have are my slides, which somehow uh, disappeared. Right. So just a second. Uh, we see, we see. Peter Winkler. Um, they were just here a second ago here, so. Uh, um, That's frustrating. I know. Yeah, it is frustrating. I'm not All sure right. why, why they don't show on my, just a second and I'll be there. We got him. We're not muted. So. Yeah, everyone, please mute if you're not going to speak. Great. All right, good for you. Thank we you, John. Are there. Okay, well, I'm sorry for the technical difficulties here. It's not a good start to the day here. First, um, thanks very much. It's, it's a genuine honor to, uh, to lead off today's celebration of Marjorie. Um, she's been a spectacular editor-in-chief of the Intelligencer and, and way more than that. Um, Marjorie's been the keeper of the Mathematical Intelligencer for a long time, I think, even before she was editor-in-chief. And it's always hard to say precisely how many years she's done that because she's done so many different things. We're here today to congratulate her and to thank her for taking such good care of the Intelligencer's traditions. She's really been a wise and diligent keeper of those traditions. Um, I say traditions because the Intelligencer is not merely a journal. It's a set of beliefs that, were, that, that formed a vision a long time ago. It was the vision of three remarkable mathematicians who conceived of the Intelligencer. And it was about a half a century ago that they did so. Klaus and Alice Peters and Walter Kaufman Bueller, all of whom worked for Springer Verlag at the time. Occasionally they claimed 
that the intelligencer was just promotion, but, but that's not right, or at least it's, it's really incomplete. The intelligencer was much more than promotion. Klaus and Alice and Walter were all mathematicians who early in their careers had somehow turned to publishing. They had a really profound understanding of mathematics and the culture of mathematics. They understood the importance of community as something separate from mathematics itself. They immersed themselves in that community. They relished it. And the intelligencer gave others a chance to relish it as well. Sure, the intelligencer helped promote Springer and promoted the books. But it was history and it was culture and it was people. It was often quirky, sometimes controversial and frequently playful. It was meant to be interesting, read rather than admired. And over the years, many people kept Klaus's and Alice's and Walter's vision alive in the intelligencer and Marjorie was first among them. Somewhat to my surprise, I've discovered recently that I'm an old timer, one of those people whose reminiscences I used to publish in The Intelligencer 40 years ago. <laughs> my association with Springer and The Intelligencer began around then. By, 19, by 1979, Klaus and Alice had moved on and Walter Kaufman Bueller was trying to convert the irregular Intelligencer into something that was regular. The initial editors, Harold Edwards and Bruce Chandler decided not to continue after about a year. Roberto Minio at the time, who was sort of on Springer's staff, took over as managing editor. But Roberto was occupied with a lot of other things and the intelligencer was struggling, falling behind, persistently short of material. So, Let's see, let me, let, me, let me stop for a second and issue one more reminder to please be sure to put yourself on mute. Let me see, let me see who this is. And Mark has the incredible power to mute anybody at all, so be careful. <laughs> it, it looks to be Gervais Chirpy, yeah. It is. So in the midst of volume two, Walter asked me to become acquisitions editor. When things didn't improve, we agreed that I'd become editor in chief. And looking back now, I realize how incredibly reckless that was. <laughs> I had no editorial experience. Walter was willing to take a chance. And frankly, it changed my life. For the next 30 years, I was involved somehow in editing or publishing all the time. Walter was one of the smartest, most erudite persons I've ever met. In many ways, we were co-editors. We talked regularly. We wrote to one another about mathematics or history or everyday life. It was Walter, by the way, who taught me how to walk in New York City. Always look down, never look anyone in the eye and they'll get out of your way. I learned a lot from Walter, who was almost oh, exactly okay. my age, by the way. Alors, écoute, ton histoire when Walter died unexpectedly in 1987, I was devastated, and I still miss Walter. From Walter and later from Klaus and Alice, I gained an understanding of the vision behind the intelligencer. Ah. Part of that vision turned out to be wrong. And that's the real topic of my talk right now. I can can someone please put on mood here. Right? Right. Actually, one thing you can do, Mark, is to put everybody on mute, and then I can unmute myself, or you can ask me to unmute myself. But yeah, anyway. all right. Yeah, I can do that. All right, when I do that. Okay, everyone is unmuted. Is everyone is muted? Okay. All right, there you go, John. Okay. 
I should be I should be unmuted now. Yeah, yes, yeah. so we we can hear you. Sorry. Um, Klaus, let's see. Klaus, Alice, and Walter were mathematicians of their age, which was my age as well. Mid-century mathematics increasingly felt international to all of us. Before World War II, lots of European mathematicians had emigrated to other parts of the world. After the war, the mathematical community gradually became more and more fluid. International meetings and exchanges and visiting positions, English dominated but, but it wasn't exclusively. Important work was still published in other languages. We ran seminars based on preprints in French or German. The mathematical world, I think, grew closer together, grew smaller. Part of that was travel. Travel funds were more plentiful around that time and mathematicians who were unencumbered by labs could take advantage of those funds. But it was a lot more mathematicians genuinely felt that they were part of an international community. There were exceptions, of course. Soviet mathematics was largely isolated from American, too bad. Chinese mathematics had few contacts elsewhere, but in general, mathematicians believed that they belonged to a mathematical community that transcended national boundaries. And Klaus, Alice and Walter believed that too. They believed it deeply. And that was essential to the intelligencer's vision. This was apparent in its authors who were from everywhere, but it was even more apparent in the bits and pieces you see here. The old intelligencer, the mathematical tourist, the filler, the quotes, the historical photos, even the letters. The intelligencer saw the community of mathematicians as something that was fundamentally international. Alice Klaus and Walter got this part wrong. The world of mathematics did not continue to grow closer. It grew apart. Yes, there's still plenty of travel, plenty of interaction, but the, ideal of a unif the idea of a unified international mathematical community began to fade roughly 30 to 40 years ago. That part of the intelligencer's vision was at odds with reality. What caused the reversal? Well, partly it's just world events, which became more fractious in the aftermath of the post-war period. Perhaps it was naive to think that mathematics could transcend the flow of history. The political turmoil in Poland in the early 80s, the breakup of the former Soviet Union in 1990, the rise of China and its rapidly growing science and many, many other events, large and small, that affected mathematics. Mathematicians constitute about one one thousandth of one percent of the world's population. Not surprisingly, mathematics floats with the currents of history, not the other way around. But I've always believed that one event turned things in the wrong direction. And I caution you here that not everyone will agree with this. Coincidentally, it took place when I edited The Intelligencer in the early 1980s. Early in the Reagan administration, the US, National Research the, the US National Research Council set up a task force for the purpose of renewing US mathematics. In the preceding decades, US mathematics had lost funding relative to the rest of science. And the task force was created to argue for more support. In 1984, it published the famous David Report, named for its leader, Ed David, an engineer, not a mathematician. The report forcefully made its case and the introduction set the tone. The reputation and achievement of the American mathematical community placed the United States first among the nations of the world in mathematical sciences research. In many ways, it was a sensible report that persuasively argued that healthy mathematics was essential for healthy science. That's the last sentence here. 
But that argument wasn't enough. The report was infused with an unseemly prideful nationalism. Americans were the best. They had the most prizes. They published the most papers. They attracted the top mathematicians from elsewhere. And American mathemat mathematics must stay number one, they argued. It was a sort of mathematical MAGA. It was shamelessly nationalistic in appeal to American exceptionalism, which was echoed in dozens of public hearings. I should note that it was repeated in similar reports over the next 37 years. Was the David report the cause of what followed? Or was it merely a symptom of something else? That's hard to say, but I think it played a key role. A second David report in 1990 was even more shamelessly nationalistic. Around this time, the European Mathematical Society, Society was created to focus on European mathematics. Americans were asked not to attend its first Congress. Some international efforts to help struggling mathematicians in the former Soviet Union were rebuffed because they were an affront to national pride. And on and on, all was based on the notion that mathematics was somehow a national competition. Ask for more, asking for more support for mathematics, of course, is a worthy endeavor, but not when it's done in an unworthy way. What can we do? Not much, I'm afraid. Appeals to national pride have become a regular feature in modern life, from research to education. We're unlikely to change that easily. But the intelligencer was meant to reflect a different view. And although that view may not be current, it's worth remembering that it was there at the start and is still there in Marjorie's intelligencer. I'm glad, I'm grateful. Mathematics is served best when its community is international. Thank you, Marjorie. That's it. Does anybody have any questions for John? I have a question about Black Lives Matter and how that fits in also to what you're saying and this whole um, piece about what America became and whether or not that factors into the pigments that are mostly in attendance here. Um, well, sure, it does, it does factor in. I think, um, you know, my, what, what I'm talking about here is sort of a vision that was around back in the 1980s. And I think at that point, um, the, kind of, the kind of understanding that we now have uh, in this country about the position of black Americans or black mathematicians in general, um, wasn't very much around here. I mean, I think that um, it, it wasn't here. On the other hand, I do think that that there was a general feeling that mathematics was supposed to transcend both national boundaries and race at that time, and that it was, it was growing. Um, so I can't say very much about, about how Black Lives Matter now affects things, but I can, I can say that I think, I, I think there, there was the idea, there was a better ideal at that point. That's, I'll leave it at that. Any other questions for John? Okay. Uh, actually, Corrine Carol Chimia has raised her hand. I don't know if she wants to speak. Oh, yes, I wanted to ask a question. I'm, um, thank you very much for your talk, which is really very interesting and raises a very important issue I wanted to ask you whether you perceived a change in the international congresses and the way in which emphasis is placed on uh, who belongs to which nation. Did you see a similar change occurring 
in the international congresses? Yeah, of course, this is a, this is a complicated story because um, World War II interrupted the Congresses in a sort of serious way and, it, and, and things were changing dramatically with the first Congress after World War II in Cambridge. Um, there, was, there was still a lot of nationalism around at that time. But again, uh, I, I think some 20 years later that the world had, had a, a much more international view of things uh, and there was much less counting of Fields medals and other things. Not not that that was wasn't done because it it was done, but I think people realized that 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 wasn't that wasn't the point here. Was how many medals did the U.S. win or how many medals did the Europeans win, and um, and so and I and I think that's gotten much worse. Just the same way that Nobel prizes have gotten much worse. I think people um, people have just you know have have somehow, they view this as, as a competition and it's really hard for them to give that up, I think. Um, I think by the way, in many cases, this is done for, with, with good intentions at least, um, in the sense that people are trying to sort of show that mathematics is important and that people should be supporting it and that, and, uh, and but I think this is, this is the wrong way to do it. Okay, thank you, John. Um, okay. So we will move on to the next speaker, uh, which is Seth Cottrell. Uh, and Seth is gonna be talking about his very popular uh, article, Burning Man's Mathematical Underbelly. So um, Seth, I don't see you on the screen, but you wanna go ahead and share your screen with your slides? Uh, I'm, uh, I've got some slides uh, for the very end. Oh, okay, uh, fine. Seth, the green button you see, share screen. Oh, share screen. So you can just. Uh, well, I was hoping to have it pointed at me. Well, you see, you see, you agree, you just click it, and if you can share whatever you have on your computer, it will, it, everyone will see it. All uh, right. Is there a way to point the camera at me to talk? Well, the cam you are you are the camera. You are spotlighted now. Oh, oh, good, 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 good. Yeah, good. yeah. Then, uh, yeah. then I will be prepared to share in a minute. So, uh, I, I went back and forth about uh, what kind of a background to have for this, and uh, ended up with uh, this is how I've been teaching recently, and I figured this is a, about as appropriate as it can get. Uh, for, uh, for a mathematical audience. So uh, my, my contribution to uh, the intelligentsia is, is pretty modest. I, I just wrote the, the one article. So uh, please forgive me, I'm, I'm gonna be a little bit selfish. I'm, I'm gonna talk about myself and talk about the article a bit. Uh, so um, I am most professional, most professional people in other fields, dentists and up, up, up the, just the, the people who deal with your eyes have a very hard time working with me because I'm continuously asking, well, what's that? And what does that do? And what is this contraction? How is this going to do whatever it is that you're, you're trying to do? Um, the only dentist left who actually returns my phone calls is the most patient person I've ever met in my life. Uh, when I was, uh, when I was very young, I believed because all things being equal that, that all, uh, um, all disciplines are, are more or less equivalent that, that you can you can ask anybody about anything and then you can explore it and learn more and learn about the universe and uh, so for example when I was in when I was in high school one of the uh, one of the school counselors offered to take me and a bunch of other students on a spirit quest and I said that that sounds great I've got a lot of questions about it and she claimed that uh, that that you could enter into a trance where you could meet your spirit animal and, and talk to coyotes and whales and that sort of thing and that they could then tell you all kinds of things about the universe and that sounded like a hell of a thing so i went ahead and did that and the first part of the claim turned out to be true you really can enter into a state of mind where you you really do feel like you're talking to your spirit animal and they're telling you very profound things and the 
second part of the claim that they can tell you things about the universe was flatly false. Um, Coyote never knew anything that I didn't know. And I mean, I asked some real basic stuff like uh, where did I lose my keys? Uh, what's for lunch? That sort of thing. And he just he had no idea. So it, it turned out that uh, that it turned out that different disciplines have different depths that you can investigate them in. And uh, so I ended up transitioning into physics because you never you never end up in a situation where you ask questions and a physicist says, well, you just have to search within yourself or you just have to trust me. There's always, here's the experiment, here's the reasoning, here's the idea, here's what we don't know, which is absolutely fantastic. But before you can get into physics, you have to learn how to speak physics and that means learning how to speak math. And uh, so obviously to study physics, I went off and became a mathematician. And uh, that led me out to, uh, to New York, where I, uh, I met my, uh, my good friend and office mate, Spencer, who was extremely New York. And uh, at the time, especially, I was extremely California. So we had a lot to talk about. And uh, at one point, uh, Spencer got invited to go out to Burning Man. He was a little nervous about it. So he invited, very naturally, his most California friend to go along. And... Uh, and I didn't know anything about it either. It was uh, all I knew that it was it was that it was somewhere out in the desert, and there were a lot of hippies, and maybe that that story about spirit animals would go over well. But I mean, that was that was it. it it's I really can't emphasize how completely unprepared we were. I remembered I remember the important stuff. I remember to bring uh, instant coffee, and uh, I think I remember to bring a hat. And Spencer, as poor thinking as he was, he remembered to bring. Uh, uh, I think it was food and, and water and, and shelter and, you know, the stuff, the stuff that you worry about after you have coffee. I would have figured it out. Uh, so so it, it turns out that at Burning Man, there's no, there's, no, uh, uh, there's no cash allowed. You're physically not allowed to carry around money or at least not show it off. And uh, they don't even have a barter economy. What they have is a gift economy where you can, uh, uh, the idea is that you just kind of give to whoever is around and whoever is around presumably will give to you. And it more or less works. There are enough people uh, participating in it that uh, on three different days when we were trying to go out and find somebody, uh, there are no cell phone, there's no cell phone service at the time. So you just kind of trust your luck in, when you're trying to find somebody. But on three different days, we went out to find somebody and ended up having pancake breakfasts at three completely random different places. Uh, but anyway, we didn't have a lot to give back. Uh, somebody suggested that we set up a, uh, a, a sunscreen stand where we can put sunscreen on people. And Spencer, every little logician, pointed out that the vast majority of people would rather burn than have us put sunscreen on them. And moreover, that the small, the small slice of the population who would rather us put sunscreen on them, we wouldn't want to spend all day meeting them. So, since we also can't cook, we can't really fix cars or anything like that. Uh, we decided that the big thing that we can give back is talking about math and physics, because that's the one big thing that we do. Uh, so we, we figured we would spend an afternoon uh, basically sitting by ourselves, because who wants to wander up to two strangers and talk about math and physics? And uh, we got some pieces of wood and a red bed sheet and uh, nailed the wood into the ground. It is a, a salt flat with nothing around. I mean, there is, on the way out, Spencer kept leaning out of the car and saying, I, I smell sugar and flowers. And I, I was very confused by that because Burning Man is an alkali salt flat. It is chemically inert. There's nothing out there. And I realized on the way out that what he was probably smelling for the first time in a while was a, a complete lack of New York, which the shock of it does smell like sugar and flowers. Uh, anyway, we nailed these, these posts into the ground and tied a, a, red, uh, a red bed sheet over it and put up a little, a little sign on it that just said, ask a mathematician, ask a physicist. And just, we figured we'd, we'd run into a couple of people who were just asking what we were doing, but we were shocked. There was just this ongoing flood. I mean, we were, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't talk to people fast enough. The, there would be a couple of people who would come in and ask a question. And then we would talk to them for a little bit and then somebody would wander in and they would 
listen to that, and then they would ask a question about that question, and these original people would go off and have another conversation and cycle back. I mean, it was just this this throng of, of people talking about math and physics. Uh, I mean, we met um, we met satellite engineers from Boeing. We met uh, 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 we met uh, physics physics undergrad students, uh, a couple of shamans, some naked people. Uh, electrical engineers. I mean, it really ran the gamut. And uh, well, for for example, the um, the very first person. I mean, we had literally just sat down on the first day, the first year that we did this. The very first person to come up was wearing this completely bizarre top hat, and and just had this incredibly sad face. And he just shuffles up and he says, "You guys, how do I find the love of my life?" We weren't expecting that at the math and physics stand, but being reasonable logicians, we said the, the solution to your question is you need to go out and meet everybody on the planet one at a time, have a little chance to talk to them, and then presumably one of those people is going to be the love of your life and your set. This guy was pretty reasonable. He had a, a bit of a math background, and he pointed out the, the technical infeasibilities of that idea. So instead, he said, all right. There's a, there is a math, a math puzzle called the secretary problem, or, or more, applicable, more applicably in this setting, the fussy suitor problem, which is you have, you have n objects, n things, any kind of things, and you are presented with them one at a time, and you have to pick the best of those n things. And you can only say yes or no, and when you say yes, you're done. So it's, it's applicable. Uh, those things can be anything, pogs, shiny rocks, uh, people with souls and life stories, any, anything at all, really. And uh, unfortunately, there is, fortunately, there is an optimal solution. You, you date the first, you pick out N people, you date the first N over E of them, so about the first third, and then you marry the first person in the, the latter two thirds that you like better than anybody in that first third. That is the solution, the optimal solution. It works about a third of the time, so it's not an ideal solution. And uh, it works just a hell of a lot better if the person you ask says yes, and uh, if they don't find out about the algorithm. And uh, I, I, I thought that was a not great answer. It only works a third of the time. But uh, this guy was actually over the moon. It, basically, it came down to the fact that because there had been mathematicians or people in general worried about this problem for so long and you can connect to it and find that not only have people come up with unreasonable solutions, but that, that there are all these people out there who have had the same problem and have been working on the same problem. So this, 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 this somewhat obscure mathematical puzzle, the fact that it applied to him, the fact that people have thought about how it would apply to his situation Although it didn't solve his problem, it didn't come close to solving his problem. It did. It did connect him a bit to how other people have approached it. Uh, there was um, there was a woman who who was riding by on a bike and was so excited to see the stand that she got off of her bike and sat down before the bike had a chance to fall over, slid to a stop, sat down, and and just froze. She had to get her thoughts together. She said, okay, oh, I've got it. If, if the Big Bang exploded out of a point, why can we still see light from the Big Bang? What she was talking about was the cosmic back microwave background. And the idea is, uh, if the universe exploded out of a point, then you would expect to see kind of a cloud You can, you can appreciate why it was so handy to have uh, a bunch of dust around us all the time. Why would there, uh, you would expect to see a cloud of matter and then around that cloud, because light is the fastest thing, you would expect a shell of light to be expanding outwards. And therefore, if we being made of matter is somewhere in here, we wouldn't see that light. Very solid question. Um, her friends and family had been giving her grief about this for years. You know, this is, this is established science. You should try being smarter. I mean, what's the matter with you asking these silly questions? But, I mean, it's a great question. Solid logic. Why, would, why do we see the light if it's, it should be shooting out? 
the, the resolution is uh, the Big Bang didn't happen in a particular place. It happened, for lack of a better word, it happened everywhere. And so that the matter and the light started out mixed and going in every direction, and it continues to be mixed and going in every direction. And of course, we had some sand and some sticks, and we had enough time to mull over it and talk about it. And of course, the conversation meandered off into other places. But at the end of it, she was thrilled, and, and she wandered off. And, and learning something new, especially about the universe, especially something that we can go out and physically observe and, and, and catalog, it, it feels good to learn new things. It, it's, it's good for the soul. But um, what I realized from this particular question was that it feels so much better when it means that other people around you are wrong. Uh, oh, oh um, a few years later, a few years later, a, uh, a guy came up to the sand, and from a distance, I mean, he had he had uh, uh, twelve rings, which for those of you who are on the who are familiar with the uh, the pigeonhole principle, have already started thinking about what that implies about his dexterity. But he was wearing twelve rings with different stones in all of them, and and leather straps with crystals on them, and he had little eyeball tattoos all over the place, and even from a distance, I had a premonition that he was psychic. And I talked to Spencer about it later. He had the same premonition. So what does that tell you? Um, anyway, he came up and sat down and he said, uh, well, how do vibrations heal people? I said, well, I'm glad you asked. There's uh, doctors use sonograms to look inside of people all the time. And it's unobtrusive and it doesn't do any damage. So it's a, a great medical device. And there are some clever techniques for pulverizing kidney stones using uh, ultrasonic waves. <clears throat> and um, it turned out, it turned out that when he was said vibrations, he wasn't talking about sound. Uh, he wasn't talking about sound. Uh, he, he was talking about vibrations in more of the, the, the vibes sense, uh, which Admittedly, I knew at the time, but it got the conversation going. He actually knew all about sonograms and, and the kidney stones thing, uh, but it gave me an opportunity to learn a hell of a lot about crystal healing, which there is a lot of material on the subject. And uh, during the course of the conversation, it became, it became very clear that just on the surface of it, just talking about these things, it wasn't at all clear which of us had the crazier beliefs. Um, he believed that uh, he believed that tiger eye is good for uh, uh, invoking wealth and uh, what was it? I think it's fractured quartz. Fractured quartz is good at scattering negative energy or keeping positive energy. I should have written it down, but it, it was it was very involved. And I realized that if I were to to rattle off my beliefs without any kind of background, I would say, well, the, the universe is a, the universe is hurtling through an unimaginable, unimaginable void. And an incomprehensibly long time ago, the, the earth was populated by gigantic bird monsters, but then they all died in a fiery death with a mountain fell on Mexico. I believe it fervently. I've seen the skeletons, but it sounds completely crazy. Today, I'm a, uh, today I, I teach uh, quantum computation and I, I research fundamental quantum theory and the stuff that I do, I can't bring up in, in casual conversation because it sounds very crazy. So it really drove home that firstly, that these conversations are as pleasant as everybody is willing to make them, but that, but that nothing you say you can necessarily assume is true. Nothing, what is true and what is real has almost nothing in common with what sounds reasonable or, or what sounds sensible. Anyway, I, 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 we went back several years uh, uh, in a row and, and every year we got more and more people. And uh, so we collected them together, collected together some of the questions we got and put them on a website. And let's see if I can give you some sense of this. Ah, here we go. Uh, I hope this doesn't crash. All right. So uh, this is this is what Burning Man looks like from orbit. Uh, it is very, very big. 
uh, that the, the word tribe in the corner there was written using water trucks, and all five of the water trucks are in the eye, uh, are in the dot above the eye. So it is a big festival. Uh, uh, we were kind of more or less in the, the center circle there. Let's see if I could get this to advance. There we go. This is the sort of thing that you can expect to see out there. So there's there's clearly a lot of a lot of very technical engineering going on at Burning Man. Uh, arguably not for the for the most productive uses, but uh, definitely for fun. And uh, this here's the the stand we set up the uh, the first year. Uh, it is exactly as uncomfortable as it looks. I, I'm kind of shocked that anybody took the time to uh, to come out and actually talk to us. But because there were so many people who came up, oh, this is uh, this is a uh, math camp. So we weren't the only people with this this bonkers idea. Uh, but we we expanded the tent and uh, uh, over the years got smarter and smarter about it. We had a, a paper sign one year that just tore to shreds in the dust storms, and uh, we brought a whiteboard, which we realized almost immediately uh, you can you can get about two lines out of a whiteboard pen before the plier dust destroys it. So we had to move on to blackboards. <laughs> we had to move on to blackboards in the future and uh, cloth signs. That's Spencer just below the ask a physicist there. And uh, finally, in our, on our last iteration, we got capes because that made perfect sense and uh, started using a blackboard which, as any mathematician knows, is the superior product. Uh, and uh, this is the, the titular Burning Man. Uh, he spends most of the time not on fire, but in the last day, they, uh, they send him up in flames. That thing is about 70 feet tall. It was uh, it's a hell of a sight. You can't get anywhere close to it. Uh, but how do I stop sharing? Well, anyway. Uh, anyway, so so uh, uh, I, I collected the uh, collected a hell of a lot of questions together and uh, turned them into uh, turned them into a book, and then uh, I did that with uh, with Mark, and then uh, later on that turned into uh, the inspiration for the article, which is why I'm talking to you guys just now. So uh, that's my spiel. Uh, Anybody have any questions about this ridiculous thing we did? Okay, well, thanks so much, Seth. It's definitely a, an interesting experience. <laughs> do you still go? Well, obviously nobody goes to anywhere uh, now, but will you, do you plan to go again? Um, not, not for quite a while. Uh, we went for the first time, I think, in 2008. I think I went four or five times total. Uh, but uh, uh, I don't know. Now, now I've got, <laughs> I'm no longer in grad school. Uh, I've, got, I've got two children who probably wouldn't appreciate it too much. So uh, no, I, I don't expect I'll be going back uh, soon. OK, great. Thank you, Seth. Um, so I guess we'll move on to the next talk. We're pretty much right on schedule, which is which is good. Maybe we're a little bit early. Shall we move on, Mark? Uh, okay. I guess I'll make the executive decision then. Uh, so let's let's move on to our next talk. Um, but we're going to need Mark's help. Sorry, help our... sorry, I was mute. I was muted. Yes, let's move on. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you need to get the video up then, because right, the next so let me uh, do that is okay. Right. I'm going to have to share my screen. So let me just get it plant. Let me just get the video started. Okay. So let me introduce it. it this is the presentation by Ashmo and uh, and uh, Christoph uh, called "Bridging Art and Mathematics: Some Case Studies in Steam Spirit." And so what they've done is put together a video for us to watch. And then if okay. there are questions it at is, the end. I'm trying to get it to load. Okay, here we go, here we go, here we go. All right, I have to agree. Okay, hold on, I'm downloading it. 
It's gonna take me a few minutes. Yeah, I didn't realize this would be. Is Osmo there? Yes, he's there. Yeah, maybe Osmo, do you have it loaded? Because I'm it's gonna, it says it's taking me about eight more minutes. Okay, uh, hello, I'm Christoph. I can try to start it, uh, but I was uh, not prepared uh, for that. Right, so I'm thanks, sorry thanks about that. that. I, I'm I sorry that I'm, but I do my best. Okay, thank All right, you. I'm sorry. No problem. Okay, actually, wait, hold on. Oh, wait, I don't know where it is. If it would be helpful, I could switch with Osmo and go next. If Mark, you're muted. Hey, I believe I have it. So hold, just hold on for a moment. Okay, I believe I have it now. Sorry about all this. I think you need to share the sound of your computer as well. So you need to start a new share and you need to tick this. No, share. I didn't realize this. this was so Christoph, do you want to start it over or maybe we'll uh, switch? Maybe we should switch. Yes, uh, please switch and I get the file until that. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. No problem. Sorry. Okay, Dan, that means you're up next. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. That's okay. Um, so next will be uh, Dan Velleman then, um, and he's going to be speaking on the fundamental theorem of algebra, past, present, and pictures. So Dan, do you want to share your screen? Yes, I will. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Sorry about that. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about the fundamental theorem of algebra. Uh, so I thought I should start by putting the statement of the theorem in front of you, probably everyone already knows this, but the fundamental theorem of algebra says that every non-constant polynomial of complex coefficients has a root in the complex numbers. Um, and uh, I promised in my title uh, past, so let me say a little bit about the history. Uh, the statement goes back to the 17th century. Some version of it was stated by various people in the 17th century. And attempts at proving the theorem go back to the 18th century. And I've listed here some of the people who made the first attempts at proving the fundamental theorem of algebra. Uh, and I'm going to focus on, on two proofs mostly. 
Uh, I've highlighted three people here, but Argon's proof was really a, a version of d'Alembert's proof. So there are really two proof ideas <clears throat> that I'll be talking about. Um, and I also promised pictures in my title. So let me say something about the visual approach I'll be taking. Um, there's a challenge right away when you think about trying to draw a picture of a function from the complex numbers to the complex numbers. And that's that it seems you need four dimensions because you need two dimensions for the independent variable, two dimensions for the dependent variable. Um, so you have to find some way of, of representing it for we three-dimensional people. And what I'm going to be doing is using color to represent some of the information. Uh, and so this idea, uh, what I'm going to be talking about, appeared in a paper in the Intelligencer uh, in 2015. Uh, one of the nice things about the Intelligencer is that it's uh, published in color. Um, I don't think this paper could have been published in very many journals, but the Intelligencer was perfect for it. Um, and so let me explain how I'm planning to use color. The idea is, first of all, to assign a color to every complex number. So here we have the complex plane. Um, and every point in the plane is a different color. Zero is here in the middle, it's black. Positive real numbers are red. And if you go in a circle counterclockwise around the origin, you'll see a standard color wheel, red, orange, yellow, green, cyan, blue, magenta, and back to red. Uh, small complex numbers, numbers with small modulus close to zero are darker. So we have darker colors here approaching black as you approach the origin. And larger numbers out toward the outside of the picture, it begins to fade out toward white at infinity. So I have a different color assigned to every complex number. And the way I'm going to use this now to visualize a function from C to C uh, is very simple. You simply color if you have a function f that you want to draw a picture of. Well, you color the point z in the complex plane with the color of f of z. So here's a simple example. This is the function f of z equals z cubed. Might be a little easier to think about it if I put it in polar coordinates. So I could say f of r e to the i theta is r cubed e to the i 3 theta. And so you see two things here. The modulus r is cubed, and the argument theta is tripled. And that leads to three things that are quite evident in the picture. Number one, uh, near the center of the picture, it's quite dark. Uh, here, it's quite dark. And that's because if z is small, z cubed is very small. And smaller numbers are darker colors. Uh, second feature, out at the outside, it fades toward white very quickly. And that's because if z is large, z cubed is very large. Uh, but I think the most striking thing about the picture is you see the color wheel repeated three times when you go around a circle. And that's because the argument down here is being tripled. And so that means when theta runs from 0 to 2 pi over 3, 3 theta runs from 0 to 2 pi, and we run through the full color wheel. And so argument from 0 to 2 pi over 3, just a third of the way around the circle, we're, we're already all the way through the color wheel. And then it repeats a second time and a third time. So this is my method of picturing functions. And so let's look at a more complicated polynomial. <clears throat> so here's a polynomial. It's down here at the bottom. It's a polynomial of degree 8. Um, one of the things you see right away in the picture is the fundamental theorem of algebra does hold. Fortunately, for this polynomial, uh, there are six roots, and they show up as six black dots in the picture. And if you're wondering why is this polynomial of degree 8 only having six roots, well, that's because there are two double roots, and you see them here. Um, I don't think I'll have time to explain this. But this is a nice little challenge for you to think about. Why, at the single roots, does it look roughly like z? You see the color wheel around each point. But at the double roots, it looks more like z squared with the colored wheel repeating twice. So there are my eight roots, to, uh, six roots, two of which are double. There's one other way with, that you can see that this is a polynomial of degree 8. And that is that for large z, the z to the 8 term is going to dominate. And so toward the outside of the picture, it looks like z to the 8. You see the colors kind of fading out quickly toward the outside. Uh, but before they fade out completely, you can see that if you go around a circle, you will go through the color wheel eight times. So we start at red, and here, an eighth of the way around, we're already back to red. And if you count, you'll see <clears throat> the color wheel goes eight times around the circle. 
Now, there's one other important feature that I want to point out in this picture. It may not be quite as evident as the things I've said so far. We see at the roots that the surrounding, the roots, of course, are the black dots. The colors surrounding black in the color scheme wrap around each root either once or in some cases twice. But in fact, that feature is true at other points as well. And let me just take a simple example. I think you can see my pointer pointing here at a, a kind of greenish yellow point. And if you look at this greenish yellow point, you'll see that there's a direction I can move in toward green. There's another direction I can move in toward yellow. There's another direction I can move in toward a lighter shade of the same greenish yellow. And finally, there's a direction I can move in toward darker greenish yellow. And those are all the colors surrounding this original shade of greenish yellow in the color scheme. So there we have uh, the same thing that we see at this point. Uh, here it's very evident that the colors surrounding black wrap around this point, but the same thing is going on at this point. The colors surrounding, uh, whatever color a point is, all of the surrounding colors wrap around it once or occasionally twice. That's another challenge for you to think about where are the points where a color, where the colors wrap around twice and what's the reason for that. At any rate, what I've just illustrated is what I'm gonna call the nearby color principle. At any point in a picture of a polynomial, all nearby colors wrap around the point one or more times. And a consequence of that is what I'll call the darker neighbor principle. In a picture of a non-constant polynomial, for every point that is not black, there is a nearby darker point. Well, that's simply because any point that any point in the plane that isn't black, in the original color scheme, one of the nearby points was a darker shade of the same color. Well, the darker neighbor principle, it turns out, is all you need to prove the fundamental theorem of algebra. So let me give you a pictorial proof of the fundamental theorem of algebra. Given a non-constant polynomial f, draw a picture of it in some disk of radius capital R. Locate the darkest point in the picture. If R is sufficiently large, this point will be in the interior of the picture. That's because as we saw before, pictures of polynomials fade out toward black as you go out toward the boundary of the picture. So if R is large enough, the boundary of the disk is gonna be very light. And so the darkest point will be somewhere in the interior. And now we just apply the darker neighbor principle. If the point is not black, then there's a nearby darker point and that's a contradiction. We chose the darkest point. So it has to be black. And that's a root of the polynomial. So there's a pictorial proof. And really, it's just a colorized version of d'Alembert's proof. Um, the uh, darker neighbor principle is a colorized version of what's today known as d'Alembert's lemma, that if f is a non-constant polynomial and you have a point z0, which is not a root, then for every epsilon, there's a complex number within epsilon of z0. Um, where the modulus of the function is smaller, of course, in the picture, that means it's darker. So this was one of the crucial lemmas in D'Alembert's proof. Uh, the proof really relies on two facts. One of them is D'Alembert's lemma, and the other, I, didn't, I just said, take the darkest point. I didn't explain how I could do that, but what I was using was the extreme value theorem, that a continuous real valued function on a closed bounded set has maximum and minimum values. So those are the two key ingredients of this proof. All right, well, the second proof I said I was gonna talk about was Gauss's. Uh, this is from his dissertation in 1799. And he started out his dissertation by criticizing all of the previous proofs. And in particular, he criticized D'Alembert's treatment of both of the key facts I just mentioned. D'Alembert's proof of his lemma was not very rigorous and Gauss was right to criticize that. Um, and secondly, uh, D'Alembert, of course, the extreme value theorem wasn't known at the time. D'Alembert simply assumed. Uh, that a continuous function um, would, would, there would be a, you could in my colorized version, a darkest point in the picture or a minimum, uh, a point where the modulus of the function reached its minimum value. He did not consider the possibility that a continuous function could approach a value without attaining that value. Okay, so what did Gauss do? Uh, after criticizing all of the previous proofs, Gauss went on to give a completely different proof um, and I can illustrate his proof with the same pictures. Uh, what Gauss did is he looked at the points where the real part of f of z is zero. 
and the points where the imaginary part is zero. And this gives us two families of curves. And I've overlaid them on my original picture here in my, this is again, the same eighth degree polynomial. I've overlaid them because I think you can see where these curves are coming from. So take, for example, the green curves, which is where the imaginary part of f of z is zero. So that's where f of z is a real number. I pointed out earlier that positive real numbers are red. Um, so these green curves go on top of all of the red points in the picture. If you remember the color scheme, uh, negative real numbers were cyan. And so here you see, for example, a green curve passing through red points. And here's another green curve that's passing through cyan points. So one of them is passing through places where the function is positive and real. Uh, and the other one is passing through points where the, um, the value of f of z is negative and real. So in some cases, here's a green curve that's red. It goes through a root and it switches to cyan. And similarly, the red curves, where the real part is zero. Those are pure imaginary, uh, pure imaginary values of f of z. And again, there's two colors that these curves pass through. Um, let's see now, here's a kind of a greenish yellow. And uh, here's a, a somewhere between blue and magenta, perhaps. OK, well, let me get rid of the, the previous color picture, and let's just focus on the curves. Uh, Gauss's first observation was that if you look at a large circle, you'll see that the curves alternate. The red and green curves alternate. Well, this is just a consequence of what we observed earlier. I pointed out in my picture of the eighth degree polynomial that around the, eight si around the outside, you have the color wheel repeating eight times. In general, for a polynomial of degree n, the color wheel repeats n times. And since each of the two families of curves, the green curves and the red curves, each one is assigned to two colors, that means you have two n green lines and two n red lines, and they alternate. Um, and now Gauss claimed that if you picked one of these curves and followed it into the circle, say you pick one of the green curves, follow it into the circle, it will have to come out again at another green point. And because of the way they're interleaved then, that means um, there will have to be a crossing of a green curve and a red curve. And where the green and the red curves cross, both the imaginary and real parts of f of z are zero. And so you've got a root. So since the points are interleaved, the curve must intersect and you must get a root that way. Well, Gauss criticized all of these previous proofs for not being rigorous, but in fact, Gauss's proof had a bit of a gap also. Um, his proof depended on this idea that if you follow one of the curves from the large circle into the interior, it will come back out. Um, and he didn't actually prove that claim. In fact, there's a footnote in his dissertation. Uh, the dissertation is in Latin, but this is a translation of the footnote. And what he said about this fact is, as far as I know, nobody has raised any doubts about this. However, should someone demand it, then I will undertake to give a proof that is not subject to any doubt on some other occasion. Now he goes on in the footnote to say, in the present case, it's, uh, this is really manifest. And he went on to give a, a sort of a hand-waving intuitive argument for why in a uh, picture of a polynomial, this fact would have to hold, that a curve that goes into the uh, circle would have to come back out. But in fact, making Gauss's argument rigorous takes a little bit of work. I believe it was first done by Ostrowski in 1920. Uh, so Gauss's proof can be justified, but there was a, a bit of a gap. In fact, uh, let me quote a couple of more modern views about this. Uh, here's what Stilwell had to say about this. It has often been said that attempts to prove the fundamental theorem of algebra uh, uh, began with d'Alembert in 1746, and that the first satisfactory proof was given by Gauss in 1799. This opinion should not be accepted without question, as the source of it is Gauss himself. <laughs> Uh, the opinion as to which of two incomplete proofs is more convincing can, of course, change with time. And I believe that Gauss might be judged differently today. We can now fill the gaps in D'Alembert's 1746 proof by appeal to standard methods and theorems, whereas there is still no easy way to fill the gap in Gauss's proof. Uh, here's a similar quote from Stephen Smale. Uh, I wish to point out what an immense gap Gauss's proof contained. It's a subtle point even today that a real algebraic curve cannot enter a disk without leaving. Um, so uh, I've given you uh, 
past and pictures I promised in my title present. Um, I don't have much time for this, but I'd like to just say a couple of words about another proof. Uh, this is from a paper by Soham Basu and myself in the American Mathematical Monthly. And it's a way of filling this gap in Gauss's proof. The idea is again, we look at a large circle where the red and green curves are interleaved. I'll say that R, the radius of the circle is an interleaving radius. And it can be shown that there are, if you look at smaller circles, there are gonna be non-interleaving radii. And there will in fact be a largest non-interleaving radius. And now I want you to imagine taking the large radius, the interleaving radius R and shrinking it. And since R zero is the largest non-interleaving radius, as we shrink the larger circle, they it will stay interleaving until we get down to R zero. And what that means is we can follow these curves into the circle and they will stay alternating red and green until we get to R zero. And we get to R zero, something has to go wrong for the radius to stop being interleaving. And it's not hard to prove that the only thing that can go wrong is that two neighboring curves have to run into each other and there's your root. All right, I don't have time to go through any more of the details, but that's the idea of the proof. It's just like Gauss's proof, except instead of following one curve into the circle and then out again, you follow all of the curves inward until two of them collide. It turns out actually it's slightly easier to look at um, horizontal lines and look at interleaving curves that as they go downward, eventually reach a horizontal line where two of them collide. Um, so I don't have time to give more details of this, but um, I would argue that this proof does fill in that gap in Gauss's original proof. Um, so I think I'll end just by pointing out, it's kind of fun to look at pictures of some other functions. These are not polynomials, of course, but I have a few pictures of other functions. You can see the branch cut of the log function here. Uh, there's a picture of the sine function. Uh, I should mention there are a couple of other people who have done similar color pictures, Larry Crone and Frank Farris, and I've given a couple of websites there where you can find their pictures. Uh, and maybe I'll just end by putting up some references. Um, the uh, paper in the monthly that I mentioned about the, my proof with Sohan Basu, a, a book with um, 11 proofs of the fundamental theorem. This is where the Smale and Stillwell quotes come from. Um, and a couple other of my papers, including the, the one in the intelligence. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Um, we have time for one short question, if someone has a short question. But we, we need to start again at uh, 11.15. So <laughs> <laughs> any, any short question for Dan? Well, I'm sure if you have a longer question, Dan wouldn't mind getting an email about it. Sure. OK. So uh, I think we've got all the technical difficulties worked out with, uh, with uh, Ashmo and, uh, and Christoph's uh, presentation. Thanks to Christoph, who was working behind the scenes to, to get it up there. So, um, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Christoph, to share your screen. And Thank, thank you very much, uh, Danielle, for filling the gap, not only in the original group, uh, proof uh, from Gauss, but also in the, in the conference. <laughs> and thanks, uh, Karen and, and Mark, uh, for uh, bringing uh, together and making uh, this opportunity uh, possible. Uh, so uh, let me share my screen and our greetings to Marjorie and to all of you is just about to begin. In a second, I also need to share the sound of my computer. And here we go. Hello, everybody. I'm Osmo Pekonen from Finland. And next to me is my dear colleague, Christoph Fenilesi, who is a Hungarian working here in Finland at the University of Jyväskylä. We are presenting a topic called Bridging Art and Mathematics in STEAM Spirit in honor of Marjorie. Dear Marjorie, dear friends, we have had a wonderful journey together with Marjorie, editing the mathematical intelligence for so many years. 
I'm most thankful for all those years and I look forward to collaborating with Marjorie's successor, Karen, as well. It's a special honor to contribute some contents for the present celebration. So I have been editing the book reviews column and hundreds of books have been successfully presented to our worldwide readership over the years. By the way, a long time ago, I studied and worked in Paris for several years. And if you are wondering about my accent, you should blame the French who spoiled it. Today, I'm based at the University of Juvaskila in Finland. We currently have a lot of snow here and I enjoy skiing despite the confinement which keeps me otherwise at home. The University of Jyväskylä, Finland may not precisely be the epicenter of mathematical activity in the world, but thanks to our long-standing collaboration with Marjorie and the rest of the intelligence staff, people all around the world are ready to believe that Jyväskylä is a major place of learning and it actually is with its 15,000 students or so. Indeed, I think that together with Marjorie, we have given quite a boost to the international reputation of the University of Juvaskila as an academic institution. For that matter, Marjorie has visited our university and she has been a keynote speaker here in the International Bridges Conference on Mathematics, Music, Art, Architecture, Education and Culture that gathered in Juvaskula in the summer of 2016. Marjorie came with her husband, Stan, and we had a good time visiting Finland together. This year, the Bridges Conference is scheduled to take place in Finland again, if possible. So I would love to see Marjorie and Stan, and all of you, again in Finland on that occasion, if possible. I also fondly remember our joint participation in a conference of mathematics and narrative writing on the island of Mykonos in Greece in 2005. One of the greatest surprises of my life was the summer 2013 issue of the Mathematical Intelligence, where Marjorie had chosen to put my niece, Sunny, on the cover. Indeed, we had visited with Sunny and her father, my brother, Sicily, and in particular Syracuse, the hometown of Archimedes, where there's a major museum devoted to Archimedes and his wonderful inventions and machines. I then contributed an essay to the mathematical tourist column of our magazine, focusing uh, on how Sunny experienced the Archimedes Museum as a 14-year-old girl. Today, my niece, Sunny, is a grown-up and she has just graduated as an engineer specializing in environmental technology. Perhaps the fact that she appeared on the cover of an international magazine of mathematics at age 14 encouraged her to choose to study natural sciences and technology. And I'm ever thankful to Marjorie for this achievement as well. Let me now introduce to you my important partner here at the University of Jyväskylä, Finland. Someone who has also contributed to the mathematical intelligence and who is involved in many other mathematical activities with the global outreach. He's Dr. Christoph Fenivesi, a Hungarian scholar and a great friend who has settled in Jyväskylä with his family and who is one of the coordinators of the International Bridges Association. Together with Christoph, we have launched a lot of international activities around the educational concept of STEAM, or science, technology, engineering, arts and mathematics. My dear colleague Christoph will now share with you some experiences about a school project that he created in South Africa. Dear Marjorie, my name is Christoph Fenvesi. I'm really thankful <coughs> for, for the opportunity that I can greet you in this important moment. However, in the same time, I'm really sorry that this <coughs> geometric phenomenon is around us and it prevent uh, to meet personally, like as we did in 2016 at the Bridges Finland 
conference who had the fortune to listen your talk in the Bridges Mathematics and Art uh, Conference in Finland or uh, a reader of the Mathematical Intelligencer. So we all know that uh, you are a great supporter of mathematical communities and indeed you provided a very important, very significant support for the Bridges community in a very hard moment. So we just lost uh, our president and founder, Professor Reza Sarhangi in 2016, when you visited the conference and gave hope uh, to our community by reminding us to such great predecessors like the Bauhaus School in your, in your talk. So I can't forget your talk, your, your important gesture you made uh, for the Bridges community and for your work, what you have done to bring mathematical communities into the limelight uh, on the pages of uh, Mathematical Intelligencer. So this time I decided to introduce you a new emerging global community, a community of children, parents, teachers who are enthusiastic about mathematics and especially mathematical connections in arts and who devote their time and effort uh, to organize children and youth mathematical art exhibits and also a larger and larger group of scholars, academics who are joining to interpret uh, these artworks, interpret them not uh, only as a passion, but also to contribute to educational development, to contribute to the work of teachers who want uh, to make mathematics and art education more creative, more interesting, more exciting, more collaborative, and more and more inclusive uh, towards uh, all uh, children's ideas, dreams, and wishes. You can see a number of contributors listed uh, in this page. This list is not a full list, not a comprehensive list. In fact, there are many, many more people around the world who contribute uh, to the work uh, of this uh, community. So uh, this mathematics and art movement uh, has uh, started uh, with uh, the help uh, of my friend and actually it was his initiation, John Arden Higley and also his wife, Dominic Higley uh, had the idea uh, to collect internationally children and youth artwork from all over the world. So they are the founder of the uh, Children's Art Gallery uh, in New York. And uh, they had a huge uh, teachers network internationally. And we decided in 2012 to uh, bring uh, these artworks also to the Bridges community and use uh, the regular annual event of Bridges to make this cause uh, available, open to all around the world and collect uh, mathematical artworks uh, from children. You can see a little ad hoc uh, exhibit uh, with original uh, children artworks uh, in the Stockholm uh, Science Museum in this picture, uh, but uh, also uh, in Linz. Uh, in uh, 2019. So the last bridges before COVID uh, was also uh, represented a quite nice, uh, great collection of uh, children artworks, especially we were so showcasing South African uh, artworks there. And uh, actually, as I told, uh, the goal of these um, art uh, exhibitions is not only to actively explore new sources of mathematics and art education, but also research on the educational potentials in creating and studying transdisciplinary uh, children artworks. So this growing uh, connection, collection uh, already holds uh, several hundreds uh, of uh, pieces uh, collected from many locations. 
And these are also initiators, these works are initiators of new kind of mathematics and art activities. So these are really uh, live uh, in other contexts and also contributing several ways uh, to initiate new kind of activities, which can be part of uh, regular learning in school lessons, but also informal activities uh, in the STEAM uh, framework. So we organize uh, these international exhibitions in various places, and actually the teachers are organizing them in several times. These are entering into real art galleries, but also schools, the walls of the uh, school uh, corridors are serving beautiful exhibition spaces. And also uh, we had uh, more and more uh, connections uh, towards uh, these activities to many, many uh, STEAM communities, mathematics and art communities all around the world. And I would like to emphasize in this talk uh, that enormous success uh, what this community uh, reached uh, in South Africa. We got wonderful response uh, from South Africa, thanks uh, to our South African team, uh, the uh, colleagues and researchers of the uh, Nelson Mandela University, uh, namely uh, Werner Olivier and Katrin Steen and their wonderful group, uh, also including Arnold Guaze and many, many friends uh, from the Nelson Mandela University. And in the same time, uh, we have also wonderful connections with uh, Cape Town uh, in the Open Design Festival, Sunestas and actively uh, supporting this community as well and giving space uh, for these exhibitions also uh, in her uh, internationally uh, noticed event uh, in, in a festival atmosphere, which is the Open Design Festival. You can see some of the pictures of how this community is also engaging into several other uh, activities. And you can see also a beautiful multicultural uh, community uh, is represented in these exhibitions. In the one of the first uh, exhibition, uh, these are those winners of, of, of the many, many hundreds uh, of submitted uh, artworks who got a special recognition, but of course, every single <clears throat> artworks are recognized and appreciated. And in this case, uh, the uh, Port Elizabeth Art Museum uh, provided a quite large space to showcase every artworks uh, what has been received in this uh, mathematics and art uh, uh, competition challenge organized in, by the NASA Mandela University. I would like to show uh, some of these uh, uh, works that you can see that how many uh, different directions, how many different ideas and how many different styles and also mathematical uh, notions and concepts are represented in these works, what we are receiving uh, from the beginning in South Africa, which was in 2018. That was the first year when uh, this uh, exhibition started and the initial response receiving several hundreds of artworks, even from the poorest uh, schools uh, has uh, told us that uh, this is uh, an important uh, way to go. And this also requires not uh, too much resources. So the threshold can be kept uh, really low in terms of resources. And as you can see, the, in the terms of outcome, there is no, no limit. Uh, there is really uh, wonderful uh, pieces and wonderful uh, creativities are exp exposed uh, in, in these works. So we really found ourselves in a very inspiring uh, mathematical artistic universe, which was uh, not a bit unexpected, I can say, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in, this, um, in, in these experiences. So uh, we, we found that also it gives us uh, new resources and new opportunities uh, to uh, go forth 
in uh, exploring the aesthetics of interdisciplinarity of art and mathematics. And that's why we started to build a research community also around uh, this, in addition to the parents' community and the children's community, of course, and also the teachers, local teachers' community. We felt that there is needed uh, to have a uh, group of, uh, uh, of educational researchers and people who are familiar uh, with how to interpret children art and also uh, people who are familiar with the mathematical concepts uh, which are represented and also other people who are familiar with uh, mathematics did didactics and more people who are representing design aspect and design thinking and many different aspects uh, of these works. And we started uh, to take a look that what kind of ideas we can get uh, to renew uh, the educational practices and how we could support teachers to use uh, these kind of exhibitions and this, this movement to improve uh, their own practices. We are running a project called Hello STEAM and uh, Osmo Pekonen, Johan Stein, uh, and Nora Shomiodi and uh, it's me uh, who are uh, running uh, <clears throat> this project and our goal is to bring uh, Swedish language, uh, mathematics and art uh, learning and STEAM learning uh, to Finnish uh, schools. And actually we just visited uh, not so long ago a town called Kokkola in Finland where this artwork, this South African artwork uh, related to the Nedebala tribe, which was also mentioned in the previous uh, artwork. And you can see this beautifully decorated Nedebala huts uh, there. And this strong statement again, Nedebalas live in mathematics. This is the message uh, of this artwork. And strangely enough, this had a very direct connection to this remote uh, little town uh, called Kokkola in Finland. We remembered from Osmo Pakonen and Johann Stein's research that uh, Kokkola is also the birthplace of uh, the 18th century explorer Henrik Jakob Vikar, uh, who was also known uh, to one of the first uh, Nordic people who, who traveled uh, to South Africa, especially to uh, Cape Town, to explore the surrounding uh, flora. And he was also the student of the polymath uh, Karl von Linné. And uh, during uh, his travel, Vikar also wrote a famous description of the South African indigenous people, including the Kosa uh, people and the, and the Sun uh, people. So we found important that uh, the children of the Finnish uh, school in Kokkola maybe could hear uh, some information about uh, this famous person uh, from their uh, town and these uh, talks uh, by Osmo Pekonen and Johann Stein to reveal uh, this uh, story, to tell this story was in Swedish. And then uh, this beautiful artwork uh, from South Africa uh, was introduced uh, to the uh, children. And this was a good opportunity to explore also the patterns, uh, the beautiful uh, visual heritage uh, of the indigenous people uh, of uh, South Africa, especially these colorful huts uh, from the Nedebala tribe, what the South African children beautifully uh, drawn and uh, what uh, it was told that uh, this is the home of mathem mathematics and these people are living inside mathematics. So this was inspiring enough also to the Finnish children to build uh, their own uh, Nedebele village uh, based on those patterns, uh, what they got to know uh, from the South African uh, children's artwork. So you can see the result uh, of this activity. And they even tried to replicate uh, um, Vicar's original map uh, from the uh, South African uh, landscape and place <coughs> their image uh, into this uh, reinterpretation of the original uh, historical map <clears throat> drawn uh, by uh, Vicar. This was a beautiful activity, such as uh, when we together uh, used, uh, implemented uh, this inspiration, this artwork uh, to uh, 
contributes to the education of future youth workers in Finland, especially those ones who are going to uh, work uh, with uh, migrant uh, people, many times arrived uh, from African uh, countries uh, to Finland. And based on this inspiration, uh, they built uh, this uh, My House, Your Home uh, project, as you can see uh, how this mathematical art uh, project inspired by children's ideas has been used in training for people who will work with children coming uh, from uh, these, uh, these uh, contexts. So let me close uh, this talk just uh, to watching and showing you these latest uh, artworks uh, which were coming in last year uh, to the South African uh, competition. So you can see this artwork, uh, my word during coronavirus. I think uh, it's very uh, complex way telling uh, about uh, also the situation of children uh, in, in, this, in this time. And uh, we shouldn't forget that uh, actually education is probably the most uh, challenged, one of the most challenged area uh, during uh, <clears throat> lockdowns and uh, during this uh, pandemic uh, times. So we should always uh, remember that and uh, we need uh, to try to change maybe with the help of mathematics and art connections just as these children, as you can see, have wonderful ideas how to respond to very important social problems, social challenges uh, through uh, their artworks uh, based on mathematics and art connections. You can see how self-expression, how ideas uh, for sustainability development uh, are represented <clears throat> in these artworks, how the joy of exploration, the curiosity is represented and also the artistic talent and also philosophical depth uh, are many times uh, uh, coming uh, to the to the to the fore in these in these works so many things uh, to think about and many topics uh, to be introduced based on the children interest so i really hope dear marjorie that you enjoyed uh, this uh, little travel, this little journey in the world of mathematics and arts, and you don't stop to contribute to the development of mathematical communities. And you are also warmly welcome in our group. We can't wait to share with you the newest artworks which will be coming in, in this year. And uh, I'm really happy to invite you uh, to our group. It would be an honor uh, to work with you on interpreting these artworks and seeing uh, this uh, project in a more appropriate uh, framework. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. And I really hope uh, that uh, we will meet soon, as soon as the pandemic is over. Thank you very much. Dear Marjorie, this was the end of our presentation. Heaps of thanks to you for all these years. Thank you both for that wonderful video. Unfortunately, though, we don't have time for any questions. But if, if anybody does have questions for either Christoph or Osmo, um, just let me know and I can send you their email addresses. Um, yeah, I'm sorry we don't have time for, for questions now. So let's move on to the next presentation, which is by Philip Ording, uh, a memo on multiplicity. So Philip, are you ready to share your screen? Um, I'm just going to speak. I'm, okay, fine. Can you see me? <laughs> yes. And you can hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, hi, thanks everyone. Um, thank you, Marjorie, um, for everything. Uh, I. Um, I'm going to talk, kind of continue the thread in, in talking about interactions between mathematics and the arts. Um, but I, I regret I don't have any, any colorful visuals from around the world to share. You're going to have to look at um, my, my talking head for a little while. But um, 
I thought um, because I imagine like um, most of you um, haven't been in a uh, conference in person, shoulder to shoulder in an audience or um, giving a talk that I would tell a conference story, um, maybe to remind you of what you have to look forward to, hopefully in the not too distant future, or maybe uh, to remind you of one of the silver linings in the cloud of forced isolation. I don't know what your opinions are about conferences. Um, I certainly miss um, seeing many of you. It's great um, to, to, to see uh, some people that I've known for a while. I've, um, and I kind of organized the, this talk um, with thinking of the conversations that I've had with Marjorie um, over, I guess about six or seven years now. Um, so once upon a time, um, there was a unusual symposium at the City University of New York. Um, the symposium drew about two dozen uh, mathematicians, artists, art historians, uh, philosophers, and architects from around the world for a, um, a series of three days of talks and panel discussions, um, as well as an arts program. And it was an event that was open to the public. Um, and the public came. Um, it was a bit of a surprise that the Science Times in the New York Times section um, picked up the event and recommended it in their weekly roundup. Um, so we saw people arriving into the Pershansky Auditorium um, with uh, the folded newspaper under their arm as if to uh, assure themselves that they had permission to be there. And uh, it was, it looked a little bit like maybe the film forum, if any of you have been to the, there in Manhattan, the audience, it, it, it looked a lot more like New York City than, than your average math conference. It wasn't like uh, Lowe's 34th Street, but still, um, the, by about the halfway through the first day, the, um, the, the auditorium was reaching capacity. And the premise of the, the symposium was a new Hilbert problem. Um, in the year 2000, Hilbert's 24th problem was discovered, um, like a message in a bottle for the new millennium. Uh, and the organizers, um, which included um, Roman Kosak, uh, who I think is on this call, and as well as Juliet Kennedy and I, uh, we thought of this um, problem, which was to come up with a criterion for simplicity. Um, so given two or more proofs for the same theorem, how can you work to compare them and figure out which one is simplest? We thought this would be a good kind of conceit for the conference um, in order because we thought, well, it's kind of a recognizable aesthetic uh, within mathematics and it seemed that we, it would be accessible to people in the art side um, and philosophy as well. And it turned out, I think, to be the case. We, we had a great group. And um, the first day we had um, a panel discussion, I, I was um, tasked with moderating uh, with a curator, an art historian, and a, and a prominent mathematician. And we were just getting going. And people kind of said polite things in each other's direction. And it was fine. And then we opened it up to questions. And I looked out in the audience. There were a lot of hands. But um, I kind of felt these sparkling eyes on me um, and uh, recognized that uh, Misha Gromov was in the audience. And um, he's, uh, so I couldn't really avoid him. I was excited that I knew he would be there, but I, I was excited that he was, had a question right off the bat. And I, I called on him and um, when the mic got to him, he started kind of slow, but he, um, he built up into a, something that I, can only describe as a rant about the comments of all of the panelists um, and a critique. Uh, I noticed that the art historian was sort of shifting in her chair and 
um, then he kind of said why he thought that the entire premise of the conference was, um, was also problematic. And at this point, I was thinking I was really glad that he didn't decide to speak on the first day. Um, he was scheduled for the second day. Um, and I noticed some other hands kind of going up and his critique was that mathematicians are not responsible for communicating um, in simple terms. Um, it's really not their job. Um, and he was saying that he thought that uh, asking a mathematician how, to communicate their thoughts in simple terms is like asking a fish, well, what, why is water wet? Um, so he was saying these things and I, I noticed some people kind of getting a little bit uncomfortable in the audience and then eventually somebody yelled from the back, uh, take his mic loud enough so that everybody could hear. Um, and I had these two thoughts immediately. Like my first thought was, oh, uh, they don't know this is Misha Gromov. Uh, there are people here, it's, you know. And my second thought was, um, wouldn't it be great if conferences operated on the gong principle, uh, like the gong show, you know, where there's somebody who kind of senses the mood of the crowd and at some point a hook comes out or, um, and they, they get dragged off the, off the, the stage or wherever. Um, but then I, I, at that moment, realized that everybody was looking at me because I was the moderator and I had to do something about it. So, um, but I don't, I don't know if you've moder moderated before. I find it really hard to interrupt people when they're talking and especially if they're older men of authority. So um, I was getting nervous. Thankfully, my, my, my fellow mathematician who was on the uh, panel, Etienne Gis, uh, doesn't suffer from this kind of excessive deference and, and, and tiptoed into the stream of consciousness that, that was coming at us and um, said, with all due respect, that he felt a personal responsibility to make an effort to communicate. Um, and the conference got back on the rails. So um, the reason that I brought this up is, well, for a couple of reasons, um, that conference is, um, was called Simplicity, um, Ideals of Practice in Mathematics and the Arts. And it's where I met Marjorie for the first time. She was a panelist there. Um, and because I think um, after I uh, spent time looking at Gromov's submission, his paper, and, and did another, uh, some other projects, I've, I've come to think that his criticism is really compelling. And, and I think it's interesting for some, some reasons that I wanna talk about today. Um, and they're not unrelated to the, uh, the, I think the program today and, and the intelligencers. So, um, one of the things uh, that, that I think comes through, um, so I guess I should say a little bit, what, did, what did is Gromov, what was he critiquing? So uh, if you look at his contribution, which is called uh, mathematical math currents in the brain, uh, he's, he had a, a vision of what mathematics in, human beings um, entails and that they're, he describes it kind of like a, a graph. Um, and on the perimeter of the graph, there are these branches and those are things that we're all conscious of, but the, the core of the graph where all of the points are, are multiply connected, uh, that is something that uh, we don't have access to. Um, it's a kind of unconscious functioning of the brain. Um, and he actually thinks that this is not unique to human mathematicians and that, um, that dogs um, are sufficiently evolved to have this core as well. It's just that they don't have what he calls the ergo um, system. They don't have the, as in the cogito of Descartes, they can't, they can't see the computations and then say, therefore something else is true. So um, that was the distinction uh, that he drew. And I think, you know, a lot of people can criticize simplicity um, for, oh, somebody's got a book there, that's good. <laughs> Thank you, Osmo. Um, you can criticize, I think, what Hilbert was proposing on, in a lot of different ways. So 
uh, yeah, even at the conference, uh, Peter Sarnak gave a talk about asking whether there was room for ugly mathematics. Um, and he gave some compelling counterexamples in number theory. Um, and I would say more recently, so in uh, actually just yesterday, there was a, a talk I heard by a theoretical physicist, um, Sabine um, Hassenfelder, and she's written a book about theoretical physics, um, asking if physics is lost in math somehow because of its unhealthy obsession with beauty and uh, naturalness or symmetry or other manifestations of simplicity. And one kind of could think that maybe Hilbert did not publish this 24th problem um, because he anticipated uh, Einstein's sage advice that you should make everything as simple as possible, but not too simple. Um, so I think that as the as you look into these ideas that, and you kind of compare what, what is Gromov doing, um, it's interesting that if you look at this, so this is mainly in his expository writing. Um, he does say what he, what he means, I think. He's so, there's just a couple of quotes. So he says, as for myself, I love unnatural, crazily unnatural problems but you stumble upon them so rarely. Um, and he kind of gives an example. He says, think of uh, what is a random group look like? As we shall see, the answer is most satisfactory. He says, at least for me, nothing like we have ever seen before. No big surprise though. Typical objects are usually atypical. Um, so that's from an article he's posted on his website, Spaces and Questions from, from the uh, 1999. So I think of this as what's interesting is um, Gromov isn't criticizing Hilbert and, and other advocates of simplicity in the usual way. I think of the usual way as to, to is a criticism of degree. People say you, you, you can't overdo it. You have to allow for certain subtleties. But I think he's actually, uh, he's actually opposed and, and is in favor of multiplicity. And so this is what I, I want to explore is whether that, you know, what is an appropriate notion of, a, of an opposite of simplicity? Um, and I took the, I don't, he never, as far as I know, uses that term multiplicity. I took that from uh, a, a lovely book of, on literature called Six Memos for the Next Millennium by Italo Calvino. Um, and it's the last lecture of, there are, there are five lectures in there. Uh, each of them expresses some quality or value that Italo Calvino thought would persist in the next millennium. So this lecture series was planned in 1985 um, as the he was invited to be the Charles Eliot Norton Professor of Poetry at Harvard. Unfortunately, he passed away before um, he could travel to Cambridge from Tuscany, but um, he had drafted five of, the, of these lectures and they were later published, those drafts. Um, so according to, and yeah, by the way, um, I learned about this book from reading the introduction to a collection called The Shape of Content um, that Marjorie edited um, with Jan Zwicky and was it with um, Chandler Davis, I believe also, um, which was a collection based on uh, years of conferences um, at Burr's um, in writing, creative writing in mathematics and science. And the, so the last of those lectures is on multiplicity and what excites Calvino about multiplicity is a number of things. He, he thinks of it as a, if you think of the novel as kind of an encyclopedia, uh, a way of knowing or a web, a network 
uh, between objects and things in the world, um, then that is a pretty good model for a lot of 20th century novels, that at least the, the ones that he's particularly interested in. So some of the examples he gives you might anticipate. There are things like Jorge Luis Borges or um, Marcel Proust or James Joyce um, and some writers that are not as widely read in English like Georges Perec and Raymond Cuno and also uh, Carlo Emilio Gada. Um, uh, and what I think is really useful about this as a possible model is that it serves a multiplicity is something that's a model, I would say, of consciousness. And that, that's really something that I think Gromov is after. But what I'd like to talk about is maybe some examples in mathematics before my time runs out. So um, if you were to look at, on the one hand, research mathematics, which is what Gromov is really talking about, um, I would say that more recently, efforts of massively collaborative mathematics are a good example of multiplicity. So um, the polymath project that started on Timothy Gower's blog um, and is now several years in and has had a lot of success is um, probably familiar to many of you. Um, but if it's not, it's uh, an open uh, format for like a blog. Um, uh, where you might have comments and people are entering in their ideas and contributions. And it certainly depends on the motivation of those who set it up, but um, these things have proved results, um, sometimes faster than people expected. And they, they use the thread um, as the basis for the, the published paper. Um, another example is something that's even more informal is something like the um, Stack Exchange or Math Overflow, um, which is something that you couldn't really bound. I mean, I don't know how you would map it, um, but it's sort of a um, something that isn't focused like polymath um, and maybe is a little bit more like um, uh, some of these large novels like um, maybe Georges Perec's uh, Life of User's Manual, where you have this entire building, apartment building that has all of its own things going on. Um, a little bit more focused still, I think, um, where you have one person writing in many voices would be a piece like Piper Heron's thesis um, from 2016. Um, she was a number theory student at Princeton. And when she wrote her thesis, she wrote it in three registers, um, uh, one for the lay person, for the initiated, and for the mathematician. Um, and then I'll just, the last one I'll mention, so I did a project to translate or adapt, I should say, the Raymond Cano's exercises and style into a collection of about 100 proofs of a really elementary result. Um, and one of the things that was surprising about that project was when it's very clear what you do. You, you keep writing proofs and varying things, but when you get to the end, how do you communicate that? And you have to make a decision about um, the sequence um, that you give your reader. And that is something that's um, very challenging to do. And um, I ended up looking at, upon the suggestion of an artist, um, how Bach did this in the Goldberg variations. There are not as many, but there's many, about 33. And he alternates. Um, there's a canon every third uh, variation. And, this, and they build, they, they're sequenced. And so I did something like that every ninth proof, um, for example, is a uh, different math subject, and they're ordered by the math subject heading number. Um, so there are tricks like that. I should stop there. I think I've gone over time. Sorry. Sorry, I needed to unmute myself. Thanks a lot. Um, we are running behind time, so we won't uh, we won't have any questions. But again, if anybody does have a question for Philip, um, please feel free to to email him. Um, so uh, looks to me like we're running about five minutes behind time, but that's just an announcement. So um, we'll just we'll just work with that. 
So I wanna go ahead and introduce uh, Lisa Goldberg. Um, she is going to speak about uh, the, her very popular uh, article that she published with the Intelligencer, Hot Hands, What Data Science Can and Can't Tell Us About Basketball Trends. So Lisa, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen, that would be great. Thank you, thank you, Karen. Yep. And please let me know, can you see this slide? Yep, we can. Okay, I'm not on my usual computer, so I hope this presentation isn't too clunky. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today, to present, and uh, thing, I really appreciate being included in this wonderful conference. Thank you, Marjorie, for giving us an opportunity to present our work for showcasing so many beautiful and unusual aspects of mathematics. This uh, topic that I will talk about today was published in Math Mathematical Intelligencer a couple of years back. It was uh, reprised in Scientific American and certainly uh, has given me an opportunity to uh, communicate some of the things I love about mathematics with a broader audience than, I, than I've ever had before. So this is just on the theme of the intelligencer and making all the, all the wonderful things that we as mathematicians appreciate about math uh, going out uh, to the world so others can enjoy them. I, I've loved looking at, at all the art and listening to all the stories so far this morning. So the title of uh, this talk is of the, of the paper that we published, the Golden State Warriors Have Hot Hands. Since uh, this is a group of mathematicians, I'll mention that this is about basketball. The Golden State Warriors are a basketball team uh, based here in the Oakland, San Francisco area. And I'm gonna focus on two of the most famous warriors, one Steph Curry, uh, one Clay Thompson, and we'll get to them in a moment. But uh, this talk, uh, this work is especially uh, personal to me because it reaches all the way back to my childhood. I have loved basketball since I was a kid. This is a picture of a team that I watched growing up, the New York Knicks in 1970, they were the world champions. And going from left to right in this picture, you see Dave Barnett, Walt Frazier, that's uh, Senator, uh, and former presidential hopeful Bill Bradley there in the middle without a shirt on, Dave DeBusher and Willis Reed. I, I don't know how many basketball play, uh, fans are in the audience here, but these guys were world changing. In uh, my childhood, they were the dream team. They were amazing. I watched every game they played. Uh, they um, have been having some trouble lately, but, but in this time, they were the big hero as much as the Golden State Warriors were a few years, uh, a couple of years ago. So what was true then and what was true now is when we would watch the Knicks play, when we watch any basketball team play now, players go on a hot streak. They start making shots. All of a sudden, a player, you think it's a great player, starts making shot after shot after shot. It seems like the player can't miss until, of course, uh, he does. And there is a strategy, which is when a player's on a hot streak, you send him the ball because his chances of making a shot are higher in these hot moments than they are generically. The concept that as mathematicians, we might be able to say, well, if a hit is a one and a miss is a zero, what does that mean about the streak? Maybe those shots are not independent. But if you watch basketball or if you uh, watch stock market, or if you watch anything where there's ups and there's downs, it does seem that there's these moments of hotness and then followed by the natural inevitable moments of coldness. We certainly had this with the Knicks when I was a kid. We have it with the Golden State Warriors today. So my roots in this go back to around 1970 and earlier, uh, as I suggested in the picture before, but in 1985, science kind of stepped into the, into the ring and three researchers, 
uh, basketball loving researchers, two psychologists and a statistician, Thomas Gilovich, Robert Fallone and Amos Tversky did a study. What they did was they applied statistics. I won't go into the details here, although we, we talk about it in our paper. They applied statistics to basketball uh, shot streaks and found that there were no streaks, none that statistics could detect. So here is a world full of fans with their pulses going up and down with the hotness of the players. And when you applied mathematical measurements to the streaks to see if they were there, none could be found. So this is, this is the result. Uh, and uh, I wanna come back to some of these authors in a second, but just before I talk about uh, Gilovich and Vallone and Tursky, we'll say the result was totally unexpected by everyone because it runs counter to our perception. And while scholars were very excited about this, this paper launched a thousand papers, tens of thousands of papers in sports and well beyond, the sports community itself was not too excited about the result. So here is the uh, NBA uh, National Basketball Association president at the time of the result by uh, Gilovich and Vallone and Tversky. This is Red Auerbach, who shrugged his shoulder and said, a study, I couldn't care less. And if this sets up a tension that may seem familiar in today's uh, climate between the, the scholars and the, the intuitive uh, anti-scholars, uh, it's certainly not new today. It's been going on for a very, very long time. Now, the reference here is to one of the three authors, something we don't like so much in mathematics and always this presumption that if you have co-authors that, uh, that the attribution should be equal to each of them. In fact, Tversky was much better known than his collaborators. I have no idea who did the work or who's responsible for, uh, these, for, for the thrust of that study if it was one more than the other. But Tversky is most often credited with it uh, for maybe not a good reason. He is the most famous. Tversky is usually known in the company of Kahneman and Tversky. These are two psychologists. If uh, you don't know about them, I think they could uh, be interesting to a lot of mathematicians. They are the uh, inventors of behavioral economics, uh, curators of how people make errors and have certainly done life-changing work in, uh, in, in the fields of psychology, economics, and uh, well beyond. So I'll, I'll continue with them uh, and talk a little bit, I'll, I'll continue with the study and, and come back more to Kahneman and Tversky in a second. So how did the study work? Well, basketball players' performance can be reduced, aspects of it can be reduced to a sequence of zeros and ones, as I mentioned earlier, zero for a miss, one for a hit. Hot handedness is a measure of streakiness. How might we do that? We'd look at whether there's runs, long runs and one zeros relative to what we might expect from just flipping a fair coin. And what they did was they looked at uh, a, a difference between what happened after a player made a sequence of shots and after a player missed a sequence of shots to see if there was something unusual in that, in that place. They did not find anything. Uh, they found that whatever was in the streaks uh, were there by pure chance. So what are the reasons for the finding? If um, many of us have, have worked only in, in, in pure mathematics, never worked with data, if you've ever worked with data, and if you're lucky enough to get your work read or, or received at all, you probably immediately got a lot of comments about how you might've done your study differently or what it was missing, or you should have had a different data set. There becomes a lot of very lively argument around empirical work. So one body of opposition to the original finding is 
that you really can't think of a shot, uh, a shooting streak as a sequence of zeros and ones because some shots are harder to make than others. So in the left picture here, this is a player, uh, James Harden, uh, making what looks like a pretty easy shot. There's no one in front of him and he's close to the basket. In the right picture, we see the very same player, that's James Harden again, shooting from far away with two players guarding him. The two players are Clay Thompson, one of the players I'll, I'll, uh, who's featured in our, our study and a teammate, Draymond Green, uh, one of the leading defenders in the NBA. And in the original study, these two shots would have been treated identically. So there's an empirical uh, objection. They said, well, your study may be fine mathematically, doesn't work in the world at all because you don't account for shot difficulty. A second explanation uh, is the one that the authors put forward. And here uh, we see Michael Lewis uh, commenting on the uh, hot hand study. Uh, I imagine that most of us are familiar with Michael Lewis. He's a writer, uh, he's a best-selling writer, famous for uh, books like um, the blind side about football, uh, about Wall Street. He wrote The Flash Boys. He wrote The Big Short. He also wrote a book about Kahneman and Tversky, these two psychologists uh, who are under, um, I mentioned Michael Lewis's perhaps most famous book, Moneyball. Moneyball is how statistics can be used in baseball. Behind the ideas Michael Lewis discovered were these two same psychologists, Kahneman and Tversky, inventors of behavioral economics. And Tversky, uh, as uh, described by Lewis, had a clear idea of how people misperceived randomness. This was what the paper said. You may think you're seeing streaks, you're not seeing streaks, you're just that your blood pressure's gone higher. But uh, there was a third explanation. 30 years after the original uh, study, two little known uh, statisticians found a mistake in the paper. And this is where I became interested in the subject. I've been following Kahneman and Tversky for years. And these are godlike figures with insight and so on. And the idea that there was actually a mathematical or statistical error in their paper had never occurred to me. Uh, claimed and, and ultimately verified by Miller and San Giorgio, the problem with the original 1985 paper is that, uh, according to these guys, is that Tversky and his co-authors had neglected a small sample bias. A small sample bias is a difference between the way statistics works in a finite sample and the way it might work asymptotically if you had lots and lots and lots of data. And a remarkable feature of the Miller and San Giorgio uh, paper is that, well, apart from it is correct, is that in a finite sequence of fair, um, a finite sequence of flips of a fair coin, a reversal is more likely than a continuation. So if you've ever heard of something called the gambler's fallacy, the gambler's fallacy is what happens when you're betting and you lose and you lose and you lose and you lose and you think, oh my God, I'm due for a win. It feels that way, even if the coin flip is fair, but it turns out, according, and it turns out that mathematically in finite samples, reversals are actually slightly more common than continuations uh, reinforcing the gambler's fallacy. The net effect of the error in the original paper is that it was, uh, the bar uh, was set too high to find the um, hot hand, to find these streaks, and it needed to be lower in order to do the statistical analysis correctly. So what we did was we took the original paper, applied it to a modern team, to these two players I mentioned earlier, Steph Curry and Clay Thompson, to their season in 2016 and 2017, 
and went off to see whether we could find, find in the data the apparent streakiness uh, that we perceive when we watch these players shoot. So uh, what we did was we looked at each game, we looked at the record of each player in each game, assigned a statistic with the small sample bias corrected and looked to see if there was statistical significance, if there was really any evidence of hotness uh, in these players. Our design automatically took account, it used the original tversky gilovich Balone statistic, but it was adjusted to take account of the small sample size. And what would we expect? A star player with no hot hand is bound to have an unusually streaky game once in a while. So the statistical significance, the p-value associated with the statistic should be significant roughly 5% at the 5% level, 5% of the time at the 20% level, 20% of the time is uniformly distributed if there is nothing special going on. So after uh, analyzing this season of data, no effect uh, after the correction, the original uh, hypothesis would be uh, consistent with seeing 45 degree lines for this red and this blue and this green, uh, green lines. These are the actual data that we have, approximately 45 degree lines. And they uh, are, are so that even after correcting for the mistake, the mathematical statistical error that was in the original paper, the evidence that we had was uh, no hot hand. So what have we done? We've looked back in history uh, to find to, to find an unintuitive result by statisticians. It stood for 30 years and launched a field. Uh, unknown statisticians found an error in it. And what we found is when you correct the error, it, certainly correcting the error, it doesn't seem to reverse the original finding, at least in the, in the data that we looked at. So this is a story I think that uh, that it was very fun to look look through, to um, be able to share uh, through the mathematical intelligencer and the summary of our findings, all written up in the paper whose uh, title I showed you on an earlier slide, is that the evidence supports the original finding. This is true even though the bar for rejecting the streakiness was lowered relative to the original experiment, but of course. This isn't the end of the story. There's more data sets, more formulations, uh, more empirical studies to do. Uh, but I do want to leave with uh, a few takeaways. One of them is that the growing body of evidence that humans do not understand randomness is convincing. This is the life's work of Kahneman and Tversky studying, psychologists studying how humans understand uh, randomness. Here they are, uh, Tversky, one of the authors of the paper and his uh, partner, life partner uh, Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize in economics for his work in uh, psychology, his work in running the field of behavioral economics. And this is a, a quote from a paper they wrote in 1971, which is 14 years prior to the publication of the Hot Hand paper. The true believer in the law of small numbers commits his multitude of sins against the logic of statistical inference in good faith. And the reason I like to put this quotation here is that the error in the paper with Tversky and Gilovich and Vallone was a small sample error. Kahneman and Tversky first became known for this paper in 1971, documenting that people make small sample errors. And one of the most important features of their work is that while we make these types of errors, we make them unconsciously, instinctively, and uncorrectively. So Tversky uh, documented this mistake in 1971 
uh, and made it in a very famous paper in 1995. Uh, I'd like to think if he were here today, he would be, be very interested in this discussion. Uh, here are the Splash Brothers, that's Steph Curry and Clay Thompson, uh, who are a joy to watch, whether they have hot hands or not. Uh, these are my co-authors. This is Alain Dox and Nishant Desai. They were engineering students at UC Berkeley at the time uh, we did this work and they've gone on to be do, uh, doing uh, data science and engineering and industry. And uh, I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, so I, I think we won't have time for questions after Lisa's talk either. Um, but again, I'm sure she would be happy to answer questions if you okay, send here's them. Here's Merle, she'll get you in. I'm at a math conference. <laughs> Here. <laughs> wow. Was it a, was it a good, uh, good presentation? Yes, very nice. So at this point, Mark is supposed to be setting up. Yes, yes, I'm going to say for the dramatic interlude. Yes, here, let me let me set it up and then we will. I will introduce our next presenters. All right, one more spotlight and we'll be ready. Ah, there you are. Great. Uh, so let me introduce um, our um, dramatic interlude. Uh, entitled On Another Plane. And one, I want to introduce Colin Adams, who um, uh, is our mathematically bent um, columnist for the Intelligencer, our humor column, so to speak. Um, and anyone who um, has also attended a joint math conference know you can spend every Saturday night at joint math laughing your head off as you attend one of his um, a series of comedic skits that he presents um, every um, every joint math meeting. So without further ado, I want to in, um, uh, introduce Colin and his collaborator today, Andrea Young from Ripon University. And without further ado, on another plane. Having spent the last four hours in the terminal, I was relieved to finally be on my connecting flight. I settled into my seat by the window, pulled some work out of my briefcase and slid it into the pocket of the seat in front of me. Then I buckled in for the short flight. Out the window, I watched the baggage handlers handling the baggage onto the conveyor belt and then turned to realize that someone had joined me in the adjacent seat. I nodded a greeting and then immediately pulled my papers out of the pocket to discourage any attempts at conversation. Planes were a good time to work on math with no distractions and no excuses to do anything else. Shortly, the plane rumbled down the runway and took off, gaining altitude fast. I was deeply engrossed in a particular calculation when the woman first spoke. You're working on mathematics. Uh, 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 yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. Uh -huh. Number theory by the look of it. Actually, uh, yes, uh, um, that's correct. Uh, are you a mathematician? <laughs> Hardly. I, I just, I find it interesting. Mm, I dabble once in a while. Oh, well, that's, that's nice. I, I noticed that you wrote down RH. Does that stand for the Riemann hypothesis? Well, actually, yes, it, it does. Are you trying to prove it? Oh, God, God, no. I'm just writing a paper where we prove various results assuming it's true. 
Well, why not just prove it so you don't have to assume that it's true? <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm not laughing at you. It's just that the, the Riemann hypothesis has been around for over 100 years. The greatest minds of mathematics have tried to prove it and failed. It's, um, shall we say, extremely difficult? Well, proving a particular function has all non-trivial roots lying on a single line in the complex plane sound so difficult. Oh, so you know about the Riemann hypothesis? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm aware of it. Well, then you probably know it's the most famous open problem in all of mathematics. Oh, I'm not much for knowing what's famous and what's not. It just doesn't seem that proving a fact should be so hard. Really? Not so hard. Have you tried to prove it? No, but it seems that the Jensen polynomials of the Riemann zeta function should be relevant. If you prove that they have only real roots, wouldn't that be enough? Well, uh, I mean, yes, that's true. But I mean, we've known that for 90 years. I mean, where did you study mathematics? You must have a PhD. Oh, I've never studied mathematics. I just enjoy reading about it. It's so abstract, the, the life of the mind and all that. Well, anyway, the approach you're suggesting has been tried before. And although recently it was proved that all but finitely many of the polynomials of each degree have only real roots, there just doesn't seem to be any way to finish it off. Couldn't you convolute the remaining polynomials and extract a higher level symmetric copolynomial? And what would be the point of that? The resulting polynomials would now fall into the set of polynomials, which we already knew had real roots, meaning the original polynomials had real roots as well. Uh, uh, I, uh, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, I, I guess you could try it, but I, I'm sure others have tried it. And given that they haven't claimed a solution, it must not work. Well, if others have tried it, I would think that they would assume a Lenoir convolution, whereas what's needed is a Kawuchi convolution. Young man, are you all right? Uh, uh, um, I, I, I just kind of feel like, I, I feel like you may have just told me how to solve the Riemann hypothesis. <laughs> have I? Oh, that's nice. Oh no, you don't understand. I, I think your method will work. I think you have just solved the biggest open problem in all of mathematics. Oh, well then. No, you don't get it. You have to publish this. This is huge. <laughs> I don't have time to write things up. <laughs> but, but if you've just solved the biggest open problem in math, you have to write it up. It's too important. This is the biggest advance of the century. Oh dear, writing is no fun at all. Huh. Why don't you write it up? M me, me write it up. You mean I'd write it up and, and we'd both be co-authors? Oh, I don't want to be a co-author. You can be the sole author. Oh, the plane is down. But, but I didn't come up with the idea, it's your idea. Oh, I just threw a few words around that sound good together. <laughs> You'll have to do the hard work of proving that it all works. Well, here we are. Nice to have met you. Wait, wait a minute, what, what's your name? I can't just take this result and not give you credit. Of course you can. Certainly all the others have done so with my blessing. Others? Oh yes, you know eventual Fields medalists, Nobel Prize winners and the like, all very nice people, many with similar interests of my own. What, but you're, you're saying? Very nice to meet you, young man. Good luck and goodbye.
struggled to grab my papers and bag and she just received the Fields Medal and felt very guilty about it. Uh, can, can people hear me? Hello? We can hear you now. Okay. Uh, as I struggled to grab my papers and bags, she disappeared down the aisle. Eventually, I did write up the solution, and I did receive the Fields Medal and felt very guilty about it. But I have to assume she chose me, so she thought I had something special, and I could fill in the rest of her outline and therefore was deserving of the recognition. So at least that makes me feel incrementally less guilty. Disclaimer, the Fields medalists and Nobel Prize winners are brilliant people who worked very hard. They are eminently deserving of their accolades. Um, so that's the end of the piece. Uh, let me just say a couple more words here. First, I want to thank Andrea. Sorry that, the, that my internet cut out at the wrong moment, but thank you, Andrea. That was great. Um, and I also want to thank Marjorie very quickly. I've been working with her uh, on my mathematically bent column since she became editor in chief. Uh, so for 15 years now, and uh, she's absolutely been wonderful to work with. Uh, she's the ideal editor. She always gives great advice and gently steers me in the right direction. So I've really enjoyed working with her for a very long time, and I'm looking forward to working with Karen and Sergey, but uh, I will miss working with Marjorie very much. So thanks very much for listening to the piece. I guess it's my turn to speak now, uh, right? Yes, Mark? it is. Yes, it is. Sergei, okay, go so, ahead. Um, I'm, I'm Sergei Tabashnikov, and uh, I will uh, introduce the speakers in our third part. And uh, with Karen, I'm a new co-editor-in-chief. I hope we'll um, do well, but it's not easy. Um, I'll say a few words about uh, Marjorie and then uh, let uh, the speakers uh, speak. Um, I think I have known her name as a mathematician for a very long time, but I met her first time in 1993. I left uh, uh, Russia in 1990, so it was my early years in this country. And it was summer of 93, and Marjorie organized a, a geometry summer Institute or a conference institute uh, at Smith College, um, which I attended along with, I don't know, about 100 other people. And um, I think it was the best uh, summer, uh, mathematical summer event in my life. I attended many, many uh, more, uh, but uh, this was uh, really exceptional. Mm, and uh, in a sense, it was the same philosophy uh, as the intelligencer. Uh, it was all about mathematics, but not mathematics only. It was also about uh, culture. Uh, it was uh, also about human uh, interaction. It was a vertically uh, organized institute, uh, which meant uh, that along with the research mathematicians were there were um, future research mathematicians, uh, students. Uh, there were uh, high school math teachers. And everyone uh, met uh, everyone else. They used this Oberwolf uh, system of rotating people uh, around tables. Uh, it was really a great uh, month uh, in the summer. And I, it was almost 28 years ago. I still fondly remember it. Uh, I hope those who attended uh, do too. Uh, by the way, uh, some people who attended, I see as participants of this conference. Uh, so uh, the last part, the third part, uh, friends and collaborators, uh, followed, by the way, uh, by uh, short presentations of uh, those who are not on the schedule. Uh, let me read uh, the uh, uh, schedule of talks. So the first speaker uh, in this part is uh, Nikolai Dalbilin of Siklov Institute in Moscow, an old uh, friend 
and a colleague of Marjorie, and I would say also an old friend of mine uh, from my previous life in uh, Russia. The next speaker is uh, Joe Dobbin, uh, Graduate Center uh, of CUNY. Uh, then uh, Doris uh, Schatzschneider, uh, Moravian College. Uh, Jean Taylor of Rutgers University and uh, Siobhan Roberts, uh, the well-known author, uh, in particular biographies of Coxeter and uh, Conway. So without further ado, uh, Kole Dalbillen, uh, Kole, are you ready? Okay, thank you very much. It's okay. Also, you reminded me that uh, the summer of 1993, I agree with you totally because really what uh, over one quarter of century, but I still remember, I'm sorry. Excuse me, excuse me. Let me, uh, <laughs> excuse me, let me uh, prepare, okay. I, I remember that event uh, organized by Marjorie yeah, at Smith College, and it maybe it was uh, the best uh, mathematical event I ever attended uh, attended in my life. I enjoyed and I enjoyed it, and I still remember very well. Thank you very much, Marjorie, for that for that gift. Nineteen ninety three summer at uh, in Northampton. Okay, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Do you do you see my pictures? We see your screen, but uh, there is uh, uh, not much uh, to see yet. Uh, excuse me. It says started screen sharing. Uh, sorry, you. Sorry, you see what uh, my my slides? Uh, not uh, slides yet. Uh, we see that we don't see. To... Mark, excuse me, mm -hmm. Nicola. We don't see your slides. Do you have them? Oh, excuse me, it, it was for me, it was a little bit. Mm. Oh my God, I don't see, I don't see screen sharing. Well, you are uh, sharing, that's what we see. It says Nikolai Dalbin mm -hmm. has started screen sharing. I think you need to click on your- Nikolai, just open your slides, Nikolai. And you should, and it should start sharing immediately. Oh, okay. Well, ah, what I see now. Mm -hmm. Now you see the picture. Not yet. No. Oh, excuse me. I think you need to click on your uh, slides. It's PDF file, right? PDF file. So you double click on this, it should appear. Everything was okay, but uh, I'm... Oh, North the law works. Uh, everything which can go you, wrong. But... You don't see still, yeah? Nope. Oh In God. Zoom, after you click on share screen, there's a window that comes up where you select what you want to share and you still have to, I think, click yeah. OK or something in that window to get the sharing to start. In fact, it seems to me that we heard Nikolai double clicking and it, does, it did not come. Uh -huh. We hear him double clicking and uh, uh, maybe it's a good idea to 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 stop sharing for and then start. Yeah, I'm gonna stop I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment. I'm gonna um I'm sorry. Um uh, Fyodor, Fyodor, Fyodor. Nic Nic Nikolai, find your slides and then I'll let you share again. Okay, F find your slide. You're not sharing anymore. Can you find? Can you get your slides, or one of us will get them for okay. you? I I show. I see my my slides. My here. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, then, then share your screen. Uh, uh, is it? Okay. Yes. So maybe I will. Uh, I will start uh, by the, by next. Uh, yes, we, we can swap the speakers. Uh, how about that? <laughs> well, there you did it successfully. Let's do it again. So Nikolai will be the second, and uh, Joe. Uh, perhaps Joe, perhaps you it? could reboot your computer. Perhaps if you reboot your computer, it will work better. Yeah, but it's just reboot in the meantime. In the meantime. Yeah, yeah. Why don't we? Sergey, why don't we move on to Joe, if Joe yeah, is ready? That's what I'm suggesting. Claire, let's move to Joe. Joe, could you start now? Uh, give me one second. <laughs> sure. My good. Yeah, OK. All right. Uh, Joe uh, Dalbin, uh, Marjorie, the Matt managing the intelligentsia, please. So I need to share a screen now too. So let me do the same. One second. I may run into the same problem that he's having. No, we can see we can see your screen. Okay. Well, now I need to just go from the beginning, right? Okay. How's that? Yes. Working. Fine. That's Matt. So here we go. Is this, I've got all sorts of stuff on my screen, so I don't see it very clearly. How does it look for everybody else? No problem. No, it's, it's good. Good. Well, I'm so grateful to Marjorie for so many things, but my connection with Marjorie and the Intelligencer has been one of the most uh, interesting and fascinating that I can recall, largely because of the personal connection of Marjorie. So what I'm going to talk about this afternoon is what that connection to Marjorie is meant. And in fact, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we actually came to collaborate on our piece for the Intelligencer Math at the Met. Now, this is going to involve the introduction of several people who are responsible, in fact, for uh, bringing us together and for encouraging us to write this piece in the first place. One of these is uh, David Minneberg. The second person I'll be talking about, actually not in this order, is Christoph Scriba, and the third is David Gross. Now, each of these people has a particular uh, personal connection to me, and it turns out to Marjorie as well, and I'll be saying a little bit about uh, all of that in the course of the next few minutes. Christoph Scriba is the person that actually brought Marjorie and me together for the first time. So I want to begin by saying a little bit about Christoph Scriba and how that actually happened. I was a graduate student at Harvard University in the late 1960s. And in order to do the research for my dissertation on Georg Cantor, I had to go to Berlin. And in Berlin, Christoph Scriba was the newly appointed and first director of the Institut für Geschichte der Naturwissenschaften, Mathematik und Technik. Now I was very lucky, and as you'll see in the course of this presentation, people I've worked with seem to come in threes. And in Berlin, my doctor fathers were Kurt Biermann, who was at the uh, archive for the uh, Academy of uh, Sciences in East Berlin, Herbert Meshkowski, the mathematician and uh, biographer of Georg Cantor in West Berlin. And he was very helpful to me in making available his own archive of Cantor Abilia, including uh, manuscripts and correspondence that I later included in my dissertation. And then of course, Christoph Scriba. Christoph and I would later go on to develop a really good friendship over the years. We collaborated in the production of one of the uh, International Commission on History of Mathematics uh, collaborative efforts, the uh, historiographic project that eventually produced writing the history of mathematics, its historical development. And then uh, Christoph uh, found himself at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And I'll say a little bit more about how Christoph got to the University of Massachusetts at Amherst in a moment. But before I do that, I want to say a little bit about David Gross. I met David at Harvard in 1967. We were both graduate students. He was a student of Mason Hammond, writing his thesis on the uh, administrative history of the ancient uh, Romans, uh, the city of Rome in particular. And I, of course, was working on Georg Cantor. And I had three American doctor fathers at that time at Harvard. Bernard Cohen was uh, one of the people most instrumental, in fact, in getting me to working on Georg Cantor in the first place. Richard Brower, the algebraist, was 
one of my advisors and was literally a primary source because he had come from Germany. And although he never uh, intersected with Georg Cantor directly, he certainly knew what the atmosphere of mathematics was like in Berlin and Göttingen at the time I was writing. And so he was a real touchstone for many of the things that I only knew secondhand, but he could help me with firsthand. And of course, the Dr. Vater that I had at Harvard was the MIT historian of mathematics, Dirk Stroek, who was one of the readers for my thesis. Um, David Gross went on to get a prix to Rome. He was at the American Academy in Rome for the year that I was actually in Berlin, which I consider my Bertolt Brecht year. After he finished that, he went on to a professorship at the University of Missouri in classics. Then he became the curator of glass at the Toledo Museum of Art in Toledo, Ohio. And from there, he went to the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. You can begin to see where the connection is coming together, where the set is being set, the stage is being set rather, for me to actually meet Marjorie. This is probably what the University of Massachusetts would have looked like at the time that Christoph was there. And it was thanks to David allowing me to come up from New York to host a dinner party at uh, his apartment, inviting Marjorie to come with her husband to celebrate the fact that Christoph Schrieb and his wife, Inga, uh, were spending a year at Smith on one of several exchanges that he participated in in the course of his career. So it was actually thanks to Christoph and David that I first met Marjorie in Amherst, Massachusetts uh, decades ago. And Marjorie, maybe you can remember, I can't remember, but it was certainly a wonderful occasion and the beginning of a wonderful friendship and subsequent collaboration. David would go on later in uh, 2007 to help redesign the galleries at the Met, the ancient Roman, uh, Greek and Roman galleries when they reopened then. And he was the consultant to the uh, Met on the reinstallation of their ancient Roman glass. So again, another connection to me, Marjorie and the Met through the people that were instrumental in bringing us together. But the person who really got us interested in the idea of writing about math at the Met was Dr. Uh, David uh, uh, Mittenberg. Uh, Mittenberg. And I want to say a few things about David uh, Mittenberg because he was himself a very interesting person um, and he's responsible for bringing Marjorie and me literally to the Met for the first time together. He was a senior lecturer in urology and public health at uh, Cornell Weill uh, Hospital uh, here in New York City. Uh, he was in the Division of Medical Ethics there and it was uh, thanks to him, he, he was the winner, by the way, of a Distinguished uh, Physician's Award from the National Kidney Foundation. He won a Silver Cross from the Austrian government. He was the Elliot Hochstein Teaching Award winner at Weill Medical College. So a very interesting person in his own right. But it turns out that he was also married to a cousin of Marjorie's. So he had a direct connection to Marjorie as well. And Wilder Minneberg uh, was the cousin to Marjorie. And she turns out to have been a docent at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in the Egyptian department. And in the Egyptian department, he became interested in Egyptology as a result. They traveled to Egypt. Uh, he went on to obtain a master's degree in Middle Eastern studies at NYU. He accepted an internship at the Met. And then he undertook a study, which was later published. Um, sorry, going the wrong way. Uh, of the mummies in the Metz collection. And this actually involved getting the mummies into ambulances over to Cornell Weill uh, Hospital to have them uh, subjected to x-rays and CAT scans in order to try and determine uh, the causes of death. And David became so interested in medicine at the Met that he actually taught a course there for his students at the Weill Cornell uh, uh, Hospital. And it eventually ran, uh, turned out to be the um, advisor and uh, uh, author of this work uh, that went with a major exhibit at the Met, The Art of Medicine in Ancient Egypt. And this was really centered around the uh, Smith Mathematical Papyrus, which was on loan to the Met from the New York Academy of Medicine uh, for the purposes of this particular exhibit. So it was David who actually brought Marjorie and me uh, to the Met and gave us his tour of medicine at the Met. And this first piece is of interest because it not only is an extraordinarily uh, detailed uh, wall uh, from the chapel of uh, Nikahor and Sekhem Hathor, 
uh, who were husband and wife and part of a mortuary cult, which was the reason that David was interested in this particular uh, piece. But among the details, which you can't really see here, uh, there's an allegory of a passage to the afterlife and what life there was like. And one of the uh, depictions is of a game that people would play in the afterlife of Senate. And I'll get to Senate again in a moment. Um, here is another uh, depiction of how one got to the afterlife. This was one of the mummies that uh, David actually uh, x-rayed and CAT scanned in his study of the mummies at the Met. And of course, it was natural for Marjorie and me to begin thinking about math at the Met. And if you haven't seen this article, um, it literally begins with Marjorie going up the front steps of the Met, and this is a photo that she took. And inside, uh, we decided to begin with a, a description of some of the numbers that you would find in pieces at the Met. And I won't go into de details about any of these, but of course, uh, Albrecht Durer's piece played an important part, um, as did this piece, a Flemish uh, work from the 16th century, uh, Isenbrand's A Man Weighing Gold. And as Marjorie pointed out, the position of his fingers actually represent the kind of finger numbering uh, that we recall from Luca Pacioli's publication of 1494. This pectoral from the Egyptian collection, David had shown to us, and it actually includes in the description a number. It's the number of God of the rising sun encircling for 1,100,000 years. Numbers also appear on gaming pieces. We talk about dice. And here are some uh, very interesting icosahedral uh, dice that were used in various kinds of games. We talked about the uh, games of chance that the Egyptians played. Uh, this is the game of hounds and jackals. It's a pursuit game. Here's another of the ancient Egyptian games that uh, was also played with dice or probably knuckle bones. And from these games of chance using dice, we of course had to include uh, card games. And this, of course, is uh, Paul Cezanne's The Four Card Players of 1890. The Cloisters, the medieval uh, part of the Met, has an extraordinary collection of playing cards. This is the only complete collection of 52 cards from a 15th century Dutch collection. Marjorie, of course, was fascinated in the photographic uh, section of the Met by this uh, photo. Um, this was actually Edward Steichen's 1920 photograph of sugar cubes. Cubes also figured in the Salvador Dali, Corpus Hypo, Hyp, Hypercubus of 1954. We went back in time to include the numbers and the kinds of mathematics that turned up on astrolabes. And then my favorite, the piece we ended with is the uh, extraordinary room. This is actually a room you can walk into at the Met. And if you've never been there, I urge you to con uh, consider doing it on your next uh, visit to New York City when that becomes possible. This is that marvelous studiolo of the Duke of Montefeltro of Urbino uh, that's actually in the Met. And it depicts all sorts of wonderful things related to mathematics that uh, you can see in this mathematically detailed perspective of the inlaid intarsia panels of the studiolo. Uh, things like armillary spheres, quadrants, captain's, uh, uh, carpenter's squares, the compass, uh, divisors, and hourglass, musical instruments. All of these reflect mathematics in various ways in this elaborately constructed room uh, based upon mathematical perspective. Now, we've thought about what we should do as a follow-up to this um, article about mathematics of the Met. You can imagine how gratified Marjorie and I were uh, just a year later when it was picked as one of the um, best writings on mathematics for the year 2016, published by Princeton in 2017. And so we've toyed with the idea of actually doing a follow-up piece, if COVID ever gives us a chance to collaborate again, we'd call it mathematics at MoMA. And of course, MoMA, in contrast to the Met, which offered an extraordinary panorama chronologically from prehistory to the present, MoMA would offer us the opportunity to talk in a, a shorter time span of modern art, but certainly much more diverse across an extraordinarily broad range of different genres. We, of course, have to include de Kirikos, uh, the mathematicians, but cubism, of course, plays a big role at, the, at, at MoMA. Picasso is one possible choice. Other cubes are actual cubes. Triangles turn up in op art at, the, at MoMA. Etchings, of course, involve spheres, spheres here in uh, one of Escher's uh, etchings. Squares, of course, we couldn't leave out uh, Joseph Alvers. And this particular cube we've already seen earlier this morning 
uh, in John Ewig's presentation of the Rubik Cube. We could talk about architecture, Marjorie, and Buckminster Fuller's works. And then the Met, the MoMA rather, has an extraordinary film collection. And if we turn to films, the possibilities are endless. We'd have to include Zorn's Lemma. I'm not sure what Zorn's Lemma actually has to do with this Hollis Frampton uh, 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 film. It goes on for 30 minutes. It involves combinations and permutations. It's quite interesting. But classic films, we can include uh, the Maltese Falcon because mathematics plays an important role there. As Sam Spade says, trying to unlock the mystery of what the uh, Maltese Falcon is, Gutman says, I'm the only one who knows. And Spade says, well, if you tell me, that'll make two of us. And Gutman says, mathematically correct, but I'm not sure I'm going to tell you. There are, of course, many films that we could look to that talk about mathematicians. Rachel Weiss, for example, in uh, Alejandro Amenabar's uh, film of 2009, Agora, about Hapatia. We could talk about Alan Turing, Ramanujan, John Nash. And then, of course, there's animation, animated movies. Uh, like this uh, uh, film that Disney made in the aftermath of Sputnik, that went up in 57. People were worried that Americans were falling behind in math. And Disney thought he could help inspire kids to study mathematics uh, by making a film in which Donald Duck, if Donald could do math, so anybody could do it. And that was the idea behind this uh, animation. But beyond animation, there are documentaries. Paul Cizere of Berkeley has done some wonderful films with Paul Erdos or a documentary about Julia Robinson. And then there are inspirational movies like Hidden Figures or Stand and Deliver. There are movies in which mathematics plays a key role in the solution, the whole overall makeup of the film as in uh, Blade Runner 2045, the sequel to the original Blade Runner. Thrillers that involve mathematics as part of their um, uh, plot element, uh, like this Spanish film, uh, Fermat's Room. And then a documentary and this is really one of my favorites. Uh, and I'm hoping this is gonna actually load. I'm not sure. Doesn't seem to be. Oh, maybe yes. If you've not seen this, it's absolutely wonderful. Pourquoi les mathématiques? C'est une question que vous êtes certainement posée souvent autrefois quand vous étiez sur les bandes de l'école ou du lycée. Vous ajoutiez même en général. Have I ever told you how much I hate math? Oh my god, math. I hate math. Math sucks. Who needs math? Ils sont tellement à te dire que c'était le dernier de leur classe en mathématiques que ça t'interroge, quoi. Comment ils pouvaient être autant de dernier? C'est la destinée de tout en maths. Les mathématiques, c'est du sérieux, c'est du solide. Ça fait peur. C'est devenu en fait un espèce de truc qui tétanise tout le monde. Non, je comprends plus rien. Ah non, mais ça, ça va pas. Math for me are just a means to get a grade to get into college. It's a selection mechanism. It's not just about mathematics. It's because of what it gives you access to. It's very political. The world's whole economic engine now. Well, that's enough to give you an idea, I think, of um, what you could find in this. Now, it's increasingly based sorry. on mathematics and science. From Google to Goldman. By Goldman of course, I want to get out of this. Well, I think I'm just going to have to finish this. Okay, there we are, Marjorie. That's the overview that I wanted to give of our wonderful collaboration. I'm so grateful to you for the opportunity to work with you on our project to write about the uh, maths at the Met. But you've done the most important thing that any editor for a journal like The Intelligencer can do, that's to pass it on to very capable hands. But we'll all look back over the 15 years that you spent as editor of the Mathematical Intelligencer, greater for all the wonderful, grateful for all the wonderful things you brought to it, teaching people not to detest mathematics, but to love it. And for that, I'm extremely grateful. And our collaboration is just one very important part of that friendship we've had over so many years. So thank you very much. And uh, I'm grateful to all of you for your attention. And that's really the end of my uh, presentation. And I can end the uh, sharing at this point and turn things back over to you. Is that okay, Mark? Uh, I think it's me. Uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, we have time oh, for sorry. one uh, quick question if anyone wants to ask. No one? 
Okay, so let's uh, try get to back uh, get yeah. back to uh, Nikolai. I, Hold I'm on. not sure. I'm not sure Nikolai is still in the. It has come back. Nikolai, are you there? I don't see him. Yes, he's here. He's okay, here. Okay, great, great, great. Uh, Kolya, are you ready? I don't, I'm not sure. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes we, right. see so, we see it. We see it. Great. Nikolai Dalbilian, and the title mm -hmm. of the talk is Marjorie and Delanez work. Kolya, please. I'm sorry for this case, but. <clears throat> Okay, I met Marjorie personally for the first time a third of century ago in Moscow in 1987. Since then, we much worked together with uh, Marjorie on a few uh, joint projects. The joint enjoyed leisure time in um, <coughs> Germany, USA, Russia, Austria, Canada, uh, Ukraine. And uh, still, I am uh, proud and happy to be uh, Marjorie's collaborator, her co-author, and I hope friend. Okay, very soon, but after our acquaintance, I realized how multifaceted and uh, unique personality was Marjorie. And uh, as far as I know, mathematician uh, Marjorie came to crystallography under the influence uh, of two crystallographers at Smith. Uh, Arthur Loeb and uh, Dorothy Rinch. I heard from Marjorie that uh, her admiration uh, for the beauty of both the external shape of crystal and the internal structure of the crystal uh, stimulated her for research, namely in crystallography. And uh, <clears throat> what this Marjorie's relation towards crystals uh, <clears throat> reminded me, and uh, it was very similar to, to <clears throat> my teacher, Delaunay's uh, perception. Delaunay uh, loved to say, crystal is the world's most beautiful and perfect structure ever created by nature. I remember this word very well from Delaunay. Okay, but this uh, Marjorie's love for crystals led her to Moscow, one of the leading centers of crystallography at that time. During what, uh, 1978 and 79 academic year, Marjorie was affiliated in Subnikov Institute <coughs> of Crystallography of Soviet Ac Academy of Science. Marjorie was lucky to some extent <laughs> because this Winter in Moscow maybe was the coldest, not maybe, for sure, the cold was the coldest on record. Some nights frost reached minus 45 degrees Celsius. And uh, Moscow looked like uh, on this uh, photo, uh, all in snow and, um, and in frost. Shubnikov Institute, this is William Shubnikov Institute. The founder of Shubnikov Institute uh, was uh, a great um, crystallographer, Shubnikov, academician of Shubnikov, um, well known for, uh, for his uh, so-called Shubnikov groups. And at that time when uh, Marjorie stayed at the Institute, um, the Institute headed by, was headed by um, uh, also the very uh, great um, crystallographer um, Weinstein. Besides, besides uh, Weinstein, Marge collaborated with Professor Sheftal, very nice and gentle person, and uh, he was offic an official vis-a-vis. -vis. Academician uh, Belov, he was not so nice person, but very influential and uh, certainly very, uh, very um, outstanding uh, crystallographer. And uh, much younger Professor Galiulin. Galiulin was uh, Ravil Galiulin. Ravil uh, Galiulin was uh, a student of uh, two uh, famous um, scholars uh, of Belov and of. Delaunay. Delaunay was my teacher. Delaunay uh, worked for the Zestiklov Institute. He was absolutely, in my opinion, legend, not only in my opinion, legendary person. He was a great mathematician. Best uh, works uh, um, devoted, were devoted to cubic defunding equations, but most known in the world, uh, his works were 
in uh, geometry of numbers and Delanet angulations. And he was a really brilliant lecturer, by the way. Delaunay um, defended from French nobles. His great, great grandfather, Marquis uh, Delaunay, was uh, the commandant of uh, the royal, uh, royal uh, prison uh, Bastille in Paris, and uh, the very one to whom uh, the rebels cut off the head on July uh, 14, in 1789, uh, in the first day of French, the French Revolution. Delaunay was, uh, by the way, Delaunay, Boris Delaunay, mathematician Delaunay, was a famous mountain climber, and uh, one of the beautiful mountains in Altai was this one. Uh, I show it, I'm showing it by Cotsor, is named after him, Delaunay Peak. But uh, next uh, several uh, sli uh, slides are a little bit confusing, because uh, here what you see, uh, uh, quadrangle, convex quadrangle. The size of this quadrangle is about uh, 400 meters, uh, CS diagonal. Uh, what this site is about 400, uh, some, some is, no, about 100, uh, about 400 meters. Uh, why this um, uh, um, quadrangle is funny? Because what M, the vertex M, um, means the building where uh, Marjorie lived in, uh, in uh, Moscow, but we named this building M. And C is the, corresponds to the building of uh, Shubnikov Institute. D is the building where uh, Delaunay lived, and uh, F is the building of Stiklov Institute. So during one year, Marjorie uh, walked uh, back and forth, um, uh, along diagonal MC almost daily. Delaunay uh, walked along this blue diagonal almost, almost also almost daily. And these diagonals uh, intersected, but, uh, but these uh, people didn't meet each other for the, the whole year. It was a very, uh, very um, interesting fact. The, nevertheless, nevertheless, Marjorie studied several Delaunay's fundamental works, in particular uh, mathematical foundations of structural analysis of crystals and uh, uh, a survey of Delaunay geometry of positive quadratic forms. What here, Marjorie, uh, Marjorie, uh, what this is a copy belonging to Marjorie of Delaunay book. Uh, and uh, this book gifted uh, to Marjorie by great uh, Britain crystallographer Alan McKay. Marjorie, during this uh, last 30 years, Marjorie has been in, engaged basically in research of modern uh, uh, crystallography on periodic crystals. Nevertheless, Marjorie has done a number of important works in the field of classical crystallography, which uh, that field which was related to the work of Delaunay. Uh, I've, um, let me uh, allow to mention uh, three of them. Uh, what uh, geometry, uh, first of all, geometry of uh, positive uh, cubic um, forms, quadratic forms, um, described, very well described the theory of perlohedra. Perlohedron uh, was introduced, uh, this is a polytope, which was introduced by uh, Russian crystallographer Fyodorov. And it is very important for crystallography because uh, it represents itself uh, some fundamental, the fundamental unit of uh, any crystal. Uh, and uh, these uh, polytopes were studied deeply by Minkowski, Voronoi, and Delaunay. And parallelohedron is a convex polytope which uh, suggests that each parallel copies can pave space, but like, no, like uh, building, bri building uh, bricks can pave space uh, by uh, parallel copies. In plain two-dimensional parallelohedron is either a parallelogram or a central symmetrical hexagon and nothing more. In three-dimensional in three-dimensional space, there are five different uh, types of perlohedra. In uh, four-dimensional, 52, but uh, thousand and thousand uh, 
uh, of types uh, in higher dimension, dimension uh, five and so on. And Voronoi invented uh, a smart idea, namely he understood that uh, any Voronoi tessellation of space, what we like here, what here, what uh, Voronoi tessellation of the plane can be, uh, can be lifted on the uh, paraboloid of revolution like a um, convex polyhedron uh, touching, touching the surface of our paraboloid. Well, this is a very nice picture, it shows approximately like what is going here. And, um, uh, and uh, based on this uh, very nice idea, he proved a uh, very um, strong and uh, important theory. Any primitive, primitive means generic perlohedron is a final equivalent to some paranoid. So uh, Voronoi proved existence, existence theory. And uh, about 70 years uh, later, uh, this famous theorem has been completed by the uniqueness theorem. It was done by uh, Marjorie and uh, Mich Louis Michel and Bereshkov uh, about, uh, in about 1995. Uh, any primitive perlohedra, not only finally equivalent to some Voronoi perlohedra, that, but moreover, there is unique Voronoi perlohedra. This was very nice uh, of classical type theorem, really. And another uh, important uh, point of Delaunay works, uh, Marjorie paid attention to, was a local approach uh, in which uh, studies studies a structure of any con condensed matter, uh, including crystals. Delaunay elegantly introduced the concept of AA system, which is uh, of local character, and uh, in contrast to the previous definitions of the same object. So in very early, about uh, 80 years ago, Delaunay paid attention to some local, um, local properties of, um, the, of uh, structures, of intrinsic structures of condensed matter. And um, <clears throat> uh, based on this uh, local definition, um, Delaunay developed elegant theory of Voronoi and Delaunay tessellations. Um, in 1970s, uh, what uh, Delaunay students, uh, under the influence of Delaunay and uh, Ravil Galiulian, developed a, a local theory of regular systems. The scope of this theory was to find the local conditions uh, for a Delaunay set uh, with crystallography group of symmetries. Madge was carried away by this theory and made serious contribution. In the 1990s, Marjorie, we jointly with Lagarius and uh, me, uh, found uh, some local conditions uh, for an orbital crystalline structure for any dimension. So we defined some local conditions which uh, determine, um, which make um, Herbert Delaunay uh, set um, uh, having a crystalline structure. Uh, and, uh, what uh, quite recently, a big, what a big paper with Marjorie's uh, courtship is coming out uh, in uh, disc, uh, discrete geometry, uh, computer, computation discrete geometry this year. The main result is a full proof of the following theorem. In, if in any, in a Delaunay set in three-dimensional space, all 10 R clusters, so neighborhoods of radius 10 R, are or the same, then X is a regular system. In other words, the symmetry group of this point set is point tra transitive. Um, what Sergei mentioned, uh, what social uh, Madri is a uh, very energy, energetic uh, person, really. Uh, he does, uh, he, he does uh, great social science work. What uh, Sergei mentioned the uh, Geometry F Festival at Smith, which was held in uh, 1993, absolutely beautiful uh, mathematical event, which attracted a lot of uh, 
uh, a lot of professionals of uh, high level like uh, like uh, um, Coxter, um, Co uh, Coxter um, and uh, no, I'm sorry. And uh, later, uh, two years ago, two years later, she organized uh, together with Bob Moody. Uh, uh, the of method, the Fields Institute in Toronto in 1995. I remember it was, uh, but this semester was very fruitful for me and uh, for instance, and she organized many conferences, workshops, uh, was a member of, uh, were a member of uh, commissions, uh, committees and so on and so on. Mother, thank you so much for this great job. Really, it is a, maybe it is a routine, but it is necessary, unfortunately, it is necessary for us, for mathematicians. Okay, Marjorie, in, in the conclusion, dear Marjorie, dear Stan, your friends Tanya, Yosha, Kolya, and Misha Storin send you warmest wishes and love from Moscow. This is the Moscow, building from Moscow University, where Marjorie gave several talks. Thank you very much for uh, listening to me, and uh, I'm sorry for some uh, defects. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nikolai. Uh, are there any questions or comments? Uh, as a brief comment, I, I must add that uh, it was the first time I met John Conway also this summer. John Conway, uh, sorry, John Conway, and after that Nobel Prize, uh, um, Penrose also Penrose was a member of that of that uh, meeting. It is a lot, a lot of uh, outstanding uh, scholars. It was and uh, a lot of uh, youth, uh, young people, uh, which uh, listened to great uh, to great scholars, really, and wonderful atmosphere, absolutely unforgettable. Thank you very much for this, much. Any questions or comments? All right, if not, we'll continue uh, with the schedule. Uh, so the next speaker is uh, Doris uh, Schneider, Moravian College, and the title is 40 Years of Symmetry and uh, Tiling with Marjorie. Doris, are you ready? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, my talk is, is going to be a bit personal, and Marjorie, I'm not going to embarrass you, but <laughs> I, I really want to highlight uh, a lot of things in uh, my travelings and collaborations with Marjorie that really made her uh, so suitable to uh, be, become an editor of, of the Mathematical Intelligencer. Uh, and so um, let me begin. Um, strangely or not, Marjorie and I were born in the same year. And we, we discussed, I, I asked her recently, you know, when did we first meet? And neither one of us could figure it out. So, um, but we were clearly both interested in symmetry and tiling and polyhedra, basically all things geometric, especially visual ones. And by 1978, we both met Bronco Grunbaum, uh, who would become both a good friend and a mentor. We were receiving drafts of his, uh, what would become the classic in tiling, the Tilings and Patterns book. Uh, we were sharing with him, but also sharing with each other our comments on those drafts. Uh, and in fact, I found by going through a very large file of correspondence between Marjorie and me, that each one of us was asked separately to, uh, by Peter Renz uh, to recommend or not uh, the publication of Tilings and Patterns. And needless to say, both of us recommended it highly. And I also found out that the first time uh, Marjorie invited me to uh, speak at a lecture in Smith was uh, in 1978. And uh, over the years, and it's been more than 40 years, uh, we've been back and forth at each other's campuses several times. Uh, over the years, both of us were involved in many conferences, many of them organized by Marjorie, uh, attending things together, 
uh, obviously special sessions of AMS meetings. Um, I'm just gonna give a few highlights to give you some idea of uh, the travels and places that we went together uh, and uh, conferences, talks we gave, et cetera. Um, the Shaping Space Smith, uh, the Shaping Space uh, Conference that Marjorie organized in 1984 at Smith was the first that I'm aware of that really brought a wide variety of not just mathematicians, but uh, other people as well. It was concentrated on polyhedra. Uh, Coxeter, George Hart, Alan Holden, Gene Pedersen, Magnus Wenninger, they were all there and lots more. And it was really a, a kind of festival. And this conference, like many of her other conferences, uh, produced a book called Shaping Space. In 1985, we went together to Rome to a conference on the work of the artist M.C. Escher and we were accompanying Carolyn McGillivary, a very distinguished crystallographer, who by that time had been very helpful and influential in our lives. In 1992, we went to MSRI in Berkeley for a conference on visualization of geometric structures. And of course, you've already heard from more than one person about the wonderful 1993 uh, Regional Geometry Institute that she organized and brought together a panoply of researchers, graduate students, and high school uh, teachers. And one thing that Marjorie did that made this conference such a success was she really wanted to, in some way, enforce <laughs> uh, the researchers to speak to and interact with the graduate students and the high school teachers. And so I was assigned to be the liaison between high school teachers and researchers. And so I had to prepare them with a pre-lecture pre prior to the researcher's lecture to get them up to speed and also hopefully to make them more comfortable actually speaking and interacting with the lecturers. Uh, we always had an after lecture session as well. Um, in 1995, as Nikolai has mentioned, uh, there was a semester in um, about quasi-crystals and discrete geometry at the Fields Institute. Uh, I spent a month there, Marjorie spent a whole semester and that's where I got to uh, work with Nikolai and I really enjoyed that. And we, we actually got some work done together. Uh, in 1996, we were in Budapest together at a geometry festival on packings, coverings and tilings at the Hungarian Academy of Science. In 1998, back to Rome and Ravello for another Escher Centennial Conference. And in 2000 in Stockholm, a conference uh, on symmetry, which again was very interdisciplinary and uh, really a, a mixture of scientists, mathematicians and others. So all of this interdisciplinary uh, conferences and meeting people uh, was really extending my, my view of mathematics, but also Marjorie's very wide view of mathematics and, and um, meeting people and making collaborations. Uh, Marjorie also was very involved in reviewing and editing. Uh, the two of us were each other's probably severest critics. We always sent drafts of whatever we were working on to each other to to um, criticize and to suggest. We also co-wrote a chapter on tilings uh, for a, a uh, compendium on discrete geometry. Uh, Marjorie was very skilled in exposition, but she also worked at it very hard. Uh, I think there's been a mention that uh, she co-organized, but also participated not in just one, but in between 2003 and 2016 in six different workshops on creative scientific writing. And of course, she was invited to give many, many lectures literally all over the world. And so all of these things, her, her uh, contributions around the world in conferences, lectures, collaborations for research, 
um, I think were really helped a great deal by her facility with languages that hasn't really been mentioned yet. She is uh, able to somehow absorb and, and communicate in Russian, Dutch, French, even Albanian. And uh, there are probably other languages that I don't even know about. Uh, because of all of this, I think it was natural that she should, when she became a co-editor at the Intelligencer, that she wanted to found the mathematical communities column. She was well aware that there were many communities that were not necessarily organized, but they were very important. Most of them, uh, they helped to sustain uh, people either professionally, personally, and also disseminate information and further collaboration. I understand she's gonna to continue to edit that column and it's wonderful. If someone asked me, could you please describe Marjorie as a person? I'd say, well, she's gregarious. She seems, she's fearless. Uh, she loves to try new things and just wades right in. She has deep interests in many, many fields and a passion to explain to others and to write. Our lives have been intertwined in many, many ways and sometimes even interchanged. I've received letters addressed to Marjorie at Moravian College and she tells me she's been stopped sometimes at conferences and thanked for something that she didn't do, but I did. So she's been a good friend, a wonderful colleague. And I want to mention something that hasn't really come up. And what, what made all this possible? All of her alliances with a wide variety of colleagues in many countries, many fields beyond mathematics. And I think what had a lot to do with it was where she was based. Her college, Smith College, was a liberal arts college encouraging cross-disciplinary work, providing time and, and funding for travel to participate in conferences, collaborations, and so on. Also recognizing editing and expository writing was valuable and encouraging and even expecting its faculty to provide stimulating experiences for its students on unusual topics. Often Marjorie would be learning about a new aspect of tiling or crystallography or some other subject right along with her students, digging into an entirely new topic. For example, the history of notation in mathematics. She'd be right there along with her students learning at the same time. So thanks for a wonderful friendship, Marjorie. We're gonna continue on, I'm sure. And it's been a great ride for more than 40 years. Thank you. Thank you, Doris. Um, <clears throat> any questions or comments? Uh, Marjorie, if you are talking to us, you are muted. I actually had something that I forgot to show from that first conference that I mentioned, Shaping Space. This is the... Um, pamphlet, I've saved it over all these years, this is 1984, but something else that I forgot to mention about Marjorie is her sense of humor. And I wanna read from the inside cover of this program. It reads, our cover design is by Wenzel Jamnitzer, Nuremberg Goldsmith. His, perspect uh, her, his Perspectiva Corporum Regulara 1568 is a set of perspective engravings of variations on the theme of the regular polyhedra. We regret that Mr. Jamnitzer will be unable to attend the conference. Thank you, Doris. Um, 
I guess we should move on. Uh, we are a little bit ahead of our uh, schedule, but nice. that's not a problem. Uh, so the next speaker is uh, Jean Taylor, and the title is Words with Marjorie. Jean, are you ready? Okay, now I'm unmuted and I'm ready, and I will share my screen. Let's window screen. All right, I have not done this before either. I'm trying to share. Oh, okay. There it is. Share. Okay. We're on. Yes. So can you, can you see me? Yes, yes. It works. Uh, all right. Let's see how this works. Um, so, uh, there is. <laughs> When, when you're retired, it's a little hard to say where you're from. I was introduced as being from Rutgers, but Rutgers keeps turning off my computer account and I have to keep working back on it anyway. So uh, <laughs> variety of attachments. Um, yeah, by the way, this picture is taken by, uh, by Stan, Marjorie's husband. Um, so we were asked to produce a, an abstract for this. Um, what happened? Uh, um, I need to get rid of it. Uh, can you tell me what to do about this little strip on the side if I want to get rid of it? You know, so, I, so I can read my uh, my own slides. I've got a problem in, in my Yeah, window. Gene, we, we can see the full slide, Gene. Do you want to just... Gene, you, don't, you want to click on, click on view, go up to the top, mouse over, you'll see view. Yep. Click on view and select, try to first select, uh, select side by side. Thumbnail video. Okay, that worked. All right. Uh, so we were asked to submit a, uh, an abstract for this. So this is my abstract. <laughs> Writing with papers with Marjorie is exhilarating and infuriating. We argue, we construct endless Zoom models, we fight with the math problems and each other, and eventually produce a much deeper and more satisfying understanding than we ever had before. And by the way, I shared this with Marjorie, and she says that that's exactly what she would say about me too. So, uh, Starting in the late 1980s, we've been writing papers together involving quasi-crystals, the first two of which were surveys uh, published in the Math Intelligencer. And we've benefited from multiple workshops as I will be um, talking about. So that's my, my abstract, that's my plan. So the beginning of our collaboration in uh, Les Zouches in a uh, uh, conference in 1989, a workshop with physicists. Um, so uh, this is the uh, picture of the Mont Blanc Massif is seen from the Physics Center at, in Les Zouches. Um, I don't know if you can see my, my, uh, my, my sweatshirt. I am, I am wearing the sweatshirt that was in the, the initial picture and that has this uh, um, uh, outline of the mountains across the, uh, the, the, the top of the, um, the, the, uh, the sweatshirt. All right, so the reason I was there was that I was a, uh, had been collaborating and writing papers with John Kahn since the early 1980s, and in fact, known him ever since I was a graduate student. Uh, I, uh, uh, um, Marjorie was there as a <laughs> crystallographer and probably knew all of the people much better, in particular, Dan Sheckman. And what the conference was about was quasi-crystals, which had been a uh, uh, whole subject initiated by experimental results uh, by Dan Sheckman. And the, uh, here, here's the paper. Uh, so uh, Khan, after uh, establishing that Sheckman's results were for real, uh, um, sort of, uh, anyway, they, they, they produced this paper in, in FizRev Lab. Uh, so after the meeting, uh, Marjorie suggested that we write a paper about it. So this was our first paper, Quasi Crystals, the view from Les Uch, uh, which is again, the same as um, the picture I showed you before. There's the, um, uh, uh, 
Mont Blanc massive. Uh, there we are in our matching sweatshirts, the one of which I'm wearing now. And, and there's the diffraction picture I showed you. So um, that, that was our first, our first effort. Our, our second joint effort, uh, Anita Hill testifying at the Clarence Thomas hearings for him being uh, Supreme Court Justice, uh, Arlen Specter, a Pennsylvania senator, was horrible in, in, in treating her in, in the hearings. Marjorie and I were in an AMS meeting in Philadelphia. We wrote a petition, got signatures, and wrote a letter to the editor. So that was our, I believe, our first joint thing. So after this initial effort of working with Marjorie, life went on for me. I went back to my usual mathematics, uh, mainly with John Kahn and some with Fred Holmgren. But then my husband died in 1997. I remarried, moved to New York. Okay, so this is, this is life going on. But then, uh, 2011, uh, Danny Sheckman got the Nobel Prize for his discovery of quasi-crystals. And um, so Marjorie and I <laughs> contacted about this. Uh, the um, um, a, a, also, a very interesting paper was uh, published by Takakura et al. This is an actual physical crystal. They made a mathematical model of it. It's a, a cadmium and ytterbium, and it has all of this fascinating structure of overlapping rhombic triacontrahedra and two kinds of golden. Uh, um, um, rhombohedra. And it, it anyway, it's just been absolutely fascinating. So we wrote another paper, <laughs> Quasi Crystals, the view from Stockholm. So we had outlined uh, sort of the, the status of the um, you know uh, uh, mathematics back in the original paper, and we were reviewing what has uh, happened since. And I think the big question being, where are the atoms? And uh, Takakura at all told us where are the uh, Ytterbium and cadmium atoms were in this uh, quasi crystalline alloy. Um, all right, so then in a uh, special session uh, that uh, Marjorie and Jan uh, organized. So, in preparing for it, I tried to make a zoom tools model of this uh, rhombic triacontrahedron cluster from this Takakura paper. Uh, my ancient zoom tools, had a, they wouldn't stick together. So, after a, a certain point, trying to push these things that wouldn't fit, the whole thing would shatter and I'd be back to a bunch of struts and balls. It was very frustrating, but it was zone uh, tools was clearly the right idea. So I bought a lot more. <laughs> uh, this is a picture of them all. They're all sprawled out on the floor uh, in my apartment behind me. <laughs> and um, uh, and here's some, some too. So at a Park City Mathematics Institute in uh, uh, 2014 um, engaged a whole bunch of the people there in making giant models, all of which based on this Takakura paper. Uh, you'll see some of the, the structures here the, um, the, that, that were all in this uh, back in. Um, so we, uh, if I can go back here, uh, we built uh, this structure, we built this structure. Yeah. Um, anyway, so um, again, zone tools. Uh, and then uh, there was an AIM workshop again. Um, uh, and uh, after that, we applied to be part of an AIM square. And the paper that came out of that uh, on the form and growth of complex crystals, again, all trying to understand this um, Takakura et al. paper. And I believe that Erin uh, is out there in the audience, at least she was at one point. Um, so the, this, this was a, a great collaboration that started. Um, I think only Erin uh, and Marjorie and, and, uh, and I are still uh, much involved in this, but in any case. Uh, so, um, so here is a, uh, uh, one of our models, that's um, uh, Marjorie's cat. Father Frost uh, admiring uh, two overlapping rhombic triacontrahedra. Oh, another paper of ours recently appeared, opening crystallography, and then we managed to be the cover uh, 
um, the cover paper, the co uh, cover picture from our paper. So this is the idea of icosahedral clusters as being um, um, stem cells for all kinds of uh, other structures that get built out of them. And uh, wrote another paper, which is about to hear the rhombic triacontrahedron and crystallography. Uh, and right now we are <laughs> this very weekend <laughs> trying to finish a paper that has a due date of Monday, uh, tilings of zonohedra and zone reduction. And again, this is another um, coming back to uh, some of the ideas that other people have talked about. Um, so we talk, you know, the uh, um, tilings um, uh, and uh, uh, parallelohedra. So uh, one of the things is to uh, not have everything be convex. So you get more uh, zonohedra. <laughs> anyway, so all of this is, uh, I mean, uh, more, uh, well, I'll carry on. Um, the, just as a, uh, a teaser for the paper we're reading, we're writing, so you might keep an eye out for it, is the idea of, what? what, can I, yes, what? Is there a problem? You're good, keep going. Keep going, okay. Uh, the idea, so the idea of zone reduction for individual um, polyhedra has been around for a long time. The idea being that uh, with the zonohedron, you have um, uh, basically everything has an opposite. <laughs> uh, so uh, the, uh, in particular, there are, there is a family of um, edge vectors for for a for a tiling, and uh, they have a finite number of them. Here there are five, and you can reduce uh, the tiling by getting rid of all those edges. So, in particular, having selected this edge, uh, there's one ribbon in this tiling. There's another one. Uh, you get rid of these ed edges and. Uh, you've reduced it to having only uh, four edges now from that tiling. Uh, now, uh, you reduce it again, get rid of another edge, and you're down to this. And um, this looks remarkably ordered compared to, um, you know, uh, to what we started off with. So, um, in fact, if you do this with a Penrose tiling, um, you start off with your five uh, directions. You get rid of two of them, working your way down. Where am I? Here we go. Um, and you uh, wind up with um, something that's periodic. So uh, again, we have actually two different groups of this in uh, um, in this paper we're writing. So here, uh, so the, the, this is what happens when you zone reduce the um, uh, Penrose tiling by by two different um, edge vectors. Uh, so Marjorie and I have also taken many walks together from uh, in beautiful Park City, uh, where the uh, Park City Mathematics Institute. Uh, so this is where the uh, the meetings were occurring, and down uh, uh, um, here is the center of town, and you can walk anyway. So we. We spent a lot of time walking back and forth there. <laughs> and also the not quite so beautiful <laughs> Brokaw Road in San Jose, where we go from the uh, um, Doubletree Hotel up to AIM. So that's about a 40 minute walk uh, uh, on uh, basically an ugly street, but nice weather. Uh, and we've eaten a lot of sushi together. So, um, this has been a long each day. We've had a lot of things that were, uh, but I'm going to end this with something uh, at least to give us all a good laugh. I think we could stand it. has nothing to do with Marjorie or me. It is just, uh, um, I got I got to show it. Wait, I'm not at the beginning. Let's try it. Yeah, where's the beginning?
Okay, so that's it. Congratulations, Marjorie, and thanks. Bye bye. Thank you, Jim. Any questions or comments? More laughs. Georgia, do you want to see the, the, the laughing again? <laughs> sit there and watch that all the time. <laughs> Okay, um, let's continue then. Uh, the last speaker for this part uh, is uh, Siobhan Roberts, and the title is Looking Everywhere and Looking Deeply. Please. Thank you. I'll share my screen. <clears throat> so I'm delighted to be here to honor Marjorie. Um, I'm a science journalist and author. And I first met Marjorie about 20 years ago when I was researching and writing my first book, a biography of the classical geometer, Donald Coxeter. He's pictured here holding the compound of two great stellated dodecahedra. And I thank Dora Schatzneider and George Hart for providing the identification, which I had forgotten all these years later. Marjorie was an invaluable source and reader, vetting my attempts at translating geometry for a general audience. I simply could not have written the book without her help and with the help of others such as Doris and also John Horton Conway, who became the subject of my latest book, for which Marjorie again was crucial. With her keen eye for detail, she always has the most wonderful stories to tell. I thought I'd share two of my favorites with you today. First, a tale about Conway. Conway, a magpie of a mathematician, a true polymath, he was ingenious, original, curious, playful, bombastic, famously disheveled, and on the odd occasion, forgetful. Once while in the UK en route to a conference in Birmingham, he got off the train and as it pulled away, he saw through the window his luggage containing his passport traveling onward without him. By the time he got it back, his return to the United States had been postponed by two weeks. On another conference trip, which Marjorie told me about, Conway left the conference and at some point along his journey to the airport, realized that he'd left behind his house keys, having stashed them for safety in what he imagined was the best secret hiding spot in his short-term furnished apartment at the conference facility. Marjorie was also in attendance at this gathering at IHES, just outside of Paris. And somehow she was charged with finding Conway's keys. She cased the room he'd just vacated, searching out the best secret spot for stashing one's house keys. Looking everywhere, she finally found the keys and Conway's passport too, in the cardboard box containing the iron. Amazing to think that an iron would even register on Conway's radar, let alone that it would be the perfect spot for hiding keys. But then again, maybe it makes perfect sense. Cogster, of course, was a different creature, but similar in various ways. He was also original, curious, playful, but razor creased and buttoned down in his suit and tie. And as Marjorie recalled, he was known to be both instructive and entertaining in revealing the hidden symmetry of an apple. Around the table at a dinner party with colleagues gathered for the American Math Society Conference in 1981, Coxeter asked, did you know that apples do not have cores? Everyone thought he was pulling their leg until the host, Marjorie, procured an apple and placed it before him with a knife as requested. She described for me how he filleted the fruit into thin horizontal sections, demonstrating that there was no stem to stern core, but rather elongated pods of seeds suspended within. The piece de resistance occurred when Coxter reached the center of the apple and sliced through its equator. There lay its secret symmetry, not nature's sloppy attempt at spherical symmetry, as suggested by an apple's exterior, but rather perfect five-fold symmetry, hidden at the heart. The seeds were arranged in a five-pointed star. 
Marjorie recalled that everyone around the table gasped when they saw it. She said to quote, it just shows that Coxter was looking everywhere and looking deeply. He delighted in the geometry of everyday objects. And because he was so curious and astute, he found symmetries and regularities in these objects that the rest of us never suspected. Marjorie too, in my experience, in leaning on her as a source and reader and editor and mentor and friend, she is always looking everywhere and looking deeply, offering layer upon layer of insight and understanding, sharing stories and sharing mathematics. Thank you, Marjorie. I truly couldn't have done it without you. And I look forward to many future collaborations. Thanks. Thank you, Siobhan. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Uh, we see Nikolai's slides. Okay. Um, all right. So this is the end of the uh, this part. And uh, Mark, probably you should continue. Right. Sure, of okay. course. So uh, first, um, I want to thank uh, my co-hosts here, okay. uh, Karen Partial and Sergey, uh, for uh, helping us to organize all these talks. But uh, mostly, I want to thank all the speakers. Uh, some really wonderful talks, some wonderful, deeply personal reflections about Marjorie. So thank you um, for all spending a Saturday with us uh, to honor our great friend and great collaborator, Marjorie Seneschal. So we have reached the time of the conference where um, people who were not speakers can deliver their own uh, personal thoughts and reflections about working with Marjorie, being her friend, um, and so we have a, a, a short list so far of people who've come forward and said they wanted to speak, but um, uh, we can also have certainly have room for, for other people uh, as well. Um, so to be, um, why don't I reach out first? Sheldon um, Axler, uh, are you ready to say something? Sure, no, <clears throat> yeah. thank you, Mark. Um, well, I want to congratulate um, Marjorie and thank her for the terrific work she's done as editor-in-chief of the Mathematical Intelligencer. John Ewing, in his talk uh, this morning, gave us the early history of the Mathematical Intelligencer. Um, just to update that and bring it up to the present, um, I was honored um, after John was editor-in-chief to be selected as editor-in-chief of the Mathematical Intelligencer, which I did for five years starting in 1987. Um, one of the papers that I accepted during that time was the paper by Marjorie and Jean Taylor about quasicrystals, the first paper that the Jean showed. So uh, Marjorie's connection with the mathematical intelligence or goes way back. Uh, by the way, during that time also, I appointed um, Karen Parshall as the editor of what was called the Years Ago column at the time. So it's delightful to see um, Karen coming back in as the new editor-in-chief. Um, following me, Chandler Davis did a terrific job as editor-in-chief. And then uh, Chandler and Marjorie were co-editors for a while um, until uh, Marjorie took over the whole thing. I see Chandler is here, by the way. So um, thank you, Chandler, for your terrific work. And then Marjorie did it, Marjorie did it for, uh, I believe, 15 years. And I can tell you from having done this, this is a huge amount of work to edit the mathematical, math, mathematical intelligence or very satisfying, but a huge amount of work um, to think that she did it for so many years. The whole mathematics community owes her a huge debt of gratitude. So thank you very much, Marjorie. Um, best wishes to Karen and Sergey is carrying on. Take care. Thank you, Sheldon. Um, great. Uh, so I see some hands yeah. raised and we will get to the people um, uh, who do want to speak, but um, I want to move on to um, uh, Asso Associate Editor of the Intelligencer now. Gazem, are you ready to say a few words? Gazem Karali? Yeah, yes, I am. Hi, I'm on the moon mm -hmm. if you can see me right now. <laughs> can yeah, you see can. me? Yep, yep, we got you. Okay, all right. So um, 
I will read because these kinds of things get too emotional for me. <laughs> um, uh, I just wanted to say a few words about Marjorie. And uh, the first sentences, the first two sentences actually apply to Chandler as well. So thanks Sheldon for bringing uh, him to the spotlight for a moment as well. So I start with this, not many get to meet their heroes. I got to work with mine. Um, and I learned uh, so much from, from Marjorie. Uh, by her gentle direction, I learned about editing. Uh, by her passing remarks, I learned about the mathematical world. And simply by her example, by being close enough to observe her, I learned about how to be a woman with a mind of her own, uh, living courageously and with both an open heart and an open mind. Marjorie also taught me the value of kindness by treating me as a valued equal when we weren't, asking for my opinion when it was not yet well formed, and generally helping me grow into my own skin. So thank you, Marjorie, for all of this and more. And I do hope to revolve in your orbit or at least be in your circle for many more years to come. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank Great. you, Giza. Thank you, Giza. Uh, why don't we move on to um, David Rowe, who uh, for many years was the years ago editor. Um, David, are you in the audience and, and are able to speak now? I believe so. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I guess, uh, yeah. Can you see me or I, I'm not yeah. sure. Yes, oh, we can see you. Yeah, we, okay. yeah, David, we can see you. Yeah. You. Well, it, this has been a splendid event, and uh, I guess my own association with the intelligentsia uh, came back to mind when John Ewing spoke this morning. I met him in Göttingen, actually, back in the 80s. And uh, so I've had a, a connection all along with many, many people in the intelligentsia. But... Um, Several people have said it very well. I think we all recognize the singular uh, role that Marjorie has played. And so some of this was brought out. I didn't know all these things about her earliest contributions, but yes, this uh, whole attitude about mathematics communities and sensing uh, how they are actually much more subtle. And you can only know that because as, a, as somebody who was a people person, she connected with so many people and really brought them together. So of course I had this wonderful opportunity for years uh, working with her as column editor years ago. And uh, it was so, so positive right from the beginning. And of course there's the critique, always very much to the point, very, and we just got along very, very well. I never imagined I would do that for so many years, but it was the pleasure of working with her that really made it so rewarding. And uh, so, yes, <laughs> uh, what a fantastic job she did. And I don't even probably, uh, I guess I really don't have any sense of how demanding that job must be. Sheldon just spoke to that. I mean, it, it has to be a very, very difficult thing to take it on. And she did it with such fervor and so positively. And uh, so we all owe her a great debt of gratitude, of course, and hats off to you, Marjorie. I hope the future will continue to bring good things. Thanks very much. Thank you, David. Um, Louisa, are you in the audience and ready to speak? Hi. Hello, Mark. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. How are you? So first, uh, I'm fine. So good. It's early morning here in Manila. So uh, first, I'd like to say congratulations, Marjorie for all the excellent work you've done for the mathematical intelligencer, and of course, for your contributions to mathematics in general. But uh, on behalf of the mathematical community here in the Philippines, we would like 
I would like to thank you for investing in a visit. You came here to Manila some 35 years ago. And it is from this visit that a research group on discrete geometry and mathematical crystallography emerged from this side of the globe. Now there are several third generation of mathematicians in the Philippines working on these uh, research topics because of you. Some of them are actually here in the Zoom meeting. They've been working on topics in color symmetry theory, tiling theory, and of course, mathematical crystallography. And so thank you for this. Uh, Marjorie, your last visit here was in 2017. And because of your talk, this has also inspired more students to work on this area. So once again, thank you, Marjorie, for everything you have done. And personally, I cannot thank you enough for bringing me into the mathematical intelligence or community. So as we say here in the Philippines, mabuhay ka. Here's to many more years of greatness. So thank you. Thank you, Louisa. Um, why don't we uh, move on to the audience? We have a couple of people raising their hands who want to speak. Uh, Paula Tella, do you want to um, you want to speak? Yes, uh, just very briefly because we are so many here. It has been a wonderful event, and I just wanted to say something to Marjorie publicly. I wanted to. Thank you for so many moments of advice uh, because we have been uh, colleagues for a few years here at Smith College. I'm here at Smith. And uh, also so many moments in which I could witness your fabulous sense of synthesis and your keen sense of what things can be put together and in what way they can be put together in a very effective way. It was wonderful to witness that in so many ways. Th thank you, Paul. Um, uh, Daniel Wickler, would you like to speak? Hi, Dan, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. So. Uh, as you know from Marjorie's middle name, uh, Wickler, uh, she has some relatives, and I'm proud to be one. Uh, Marge and I go way back about 74 years. And uh, uh, let, uh, let me just add a couple of observations uh, that won't be news to many of you, I'm not sure. What we've heard about today is just a fraction of what Marge actually does. Uh, Marge has uh, her, her interests are incredibly broad, and in the many, many areas that she works in, what's amazed me is how deep her involvement is. Uh, where many of you are aware of some of these projects of hers, I won't listen, but they, they, they're just all over the place. Starting with the with the lifelong work of our father, A. a Wickler, who we didn't know, it was a pioneer in the field of uh, drug addiction. March, even today, uh, coming up with insights in that field that uh, are, uh, of, of, I think, quite a great significance. Um, uh, I guess the only other observation I'll make at this time is that uh, March's, uh, and we have experienced March's personal generosity. Uh, someone who's been a family member all these years uh, and uh, I'm often in contact with March like five times a day on, on, or more on Sundays. Uh, I can tell you that I hear about March's acts of generosity only by chance, never from March, almost always from other people, from other evidence. And I, and I know from the fact that I hear about it so indirectly that there have to be many, many more instances that, that never reach me. Uh, March is, uh, she's generous to a fault, but also uh, uh, rigorously uh, modest about it, and uh, for her, uh, it's essential that uh, that her, her acts of 
IRS may not be publicized or even widely known. And uh, I can, I've been a beneficiary of the service since I saw it been printed on March intellectually, but I was still in uh, uh, middle school. March went up to the University of Chicago and started, she sort of took control of my intellectual development from afar with uh, back and forth letters. It's never stopped. Uh, and some of my happiest moments, even in these last decades, have been when she got me interested in enough for innumerable pursuits to sign up as an unpaid research assistant. Uh, sometimes the, the work that I would do to support Marge's work would take over my own. I'd uh, never regret. So, Marge, uh, <laughs> what a wonderful sister you've been, and uh, quite an amazing human being. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dan. Um, Jeff Legarius, would you like to speak? Jeff, you are muted. Yes. Well, um, I was at many of the discrete geometry conferences and the one in Smith, uh, they, they were all fabulous. Um, they helped me a lot. I, I greatly enjoyed them. They the, uh, just belonged and brought me in, helped bring me into the, the uh, discrete geometry community. Uh, it was really wonderful. Appreciated all, the, all your support all these years. Great, great, Jeff. Thank you. Um, Mirella, I, be, I believe you, you raised your hand. So. The floor is yours. Okay. Um, so I met Marjorie in Albania in 1993 when I was a high school student um, with internet not being available at the time. I didn't know anything about and Albania being as closed as it was. Um, I didn't really know anything about the outside world in terms of possibilities. Um, anyway, Marjorie and Stan came to my house and Marjorie suggested that I should go to Smith, which was um, the equivalent of saying, um, well, how much why don't you go to the moon? We are now really coming to the end. Um, I think I need anyway, to start lunch um, and you can join me when you wish to. <laughs> okay. So to make a long story short, I um, went to Smith in uh, 96 and 95 and um, no, 96, sorry. And um, Marjorie was um, basically my home in all the senses of this world word because um, the way, you know, being in a different country in a place where everything is different. Um, you barely, well, I spoke the language, but not all that well. Having somebody who knew me um, felt like an anchor, you know, where to, you know, stay a way to stay myself. And throughout all these years, she's been, um, well, an additional parent to me, basically. Um, and um, well, again, to make a long story short, she also uh, officiated our marriage, I mean, with my husband who is preparing lunch right now. Um, and um, anyway, it's a wonderful, um, well, it's wonderful to have Marjorie in my life every day. So I'll stop here. Thank you, Marjorie. Thank you, Marilla. Uh, Christoph, you had raised your hand. Would you like to speak? Sure. And so that's a Smith uh, theme. Uh, Mirella, hello again. Fun to see you. And Marjorie, um, I want to relate uh, the effect that Marjorie has had not only on uh, our small mathematical uh, department at Smith, I'm the, presently the, the chair, uh, but also at Smith. And so what, what everybody has related about uh, Marjorie's uh, enormous capacity of connecting people and connecting fields and con connecting thoughts, uh, she, she put that and imprinted that 
very much so in, um, in our math department, as Mirella just related uh, an example. But for instance, you walk in some corridors at Smith and you will see uh, a reproduction of an early um, programmable loom that she built with students, you know, and, and would apply mathematical uh, analysis to, to, to that. Um, you know, one of the most important things that she did was to encourage people like um, younger faculty that I was when I came in, uh, maybe the year after Mirella, um, to, to explore beyond mathematics and explore connections. And I ended up doing work in um, mathematical biology and, and uh, plant patterns and uh, Brave, uh, in crystallography, it was actually the you know one of the most important researcher in in uh, phytotaxis, the the field that I'm looking at. It's a two dimensional crystallography in many ways. Um, but one thing that people might want to know is that this enormous capacity that Marjorie has to bring fields together, she managed to create a little institution without within our institution, namely she created what is called now at Smith, the Khan uh, Institute. And the Khan Institute brings together uh, faculty from the, the region, the, the five colleges around us and students and to work on a theme that can be very abstract. I participated to two. One was called uh, Europe's Others and Others Europe's. And another one was called Placing Space. and. Uh, we had dancers, we had historians, we had astronomers, we had, you know, complete people working together on this general theme, uh, sharing our research in this, you know, in those themes. And that, that was in incredibly uh, enriching. So thank you, Marjorie, and uh, your dream lives on. Bye. Th th thank you, Christoph. Um, we are getting towards the end of this. Uh, virtual conference, but uh, before we turn it over to Marjorie um, for a few words and then Toaster, if, if you haven't picked up your libation of choice, please do so. I want to uh, turn the Zoom mic over to another very important uh, figure in the history of the mathematical intelligence and mathematics. Um, that is uh, Marjorie's predecessor as editor in chief uh, Chandler Davis. So Chandler, the floor oh, is yours. Am I on? Yes, you are there. Am I visible? Yes, you are. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I, I want to say that uh, I came to the Intelligencer and to friendship with Marjorie with a great many things already in common. For instance, Smith College, my mother, my wife, and one of my sisters Smith graduates, and I knew the campus well. And, and uh, another is um, friendship with Donald Coxeter. So I guess my friendship with Coxeter, like my friendship with Dirk Stroik, goes back even farther in time than Marjorie's. And another is um, willing and unreasonably optimistic efforts to save the world from its own uh, uh, suicide. And uh, uh, Marjorie, without talking much about it, is a very vital contributor to worthy causes, which uh, I'm happy to be her collaborator in. And in spite of all this, the uh, main uh, 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 contribution which I feel in, uh, from Marjorie to the intelligencer and to life is her favorite word, community. As she brought people together who would perhaps be only uh, 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 ne next to each other in a filing cabinet. She brought people together in person and, uh, uh, and uh, forged uh, uh, genuine human links. And uh, I think that today's uh, uh, session is a wonderful way to express this. And I thank you, Mark, and I thank you, 
uh, <coughs> of, of course, to Sergey and, and Karen for uh, having this uh, this uh, virtual meeting where we can all share. And uh, and thank you, of course, most of all to Marjorie. Th thank you, Chandler. Um, and thank you for all your contributions to the magazine. Uh, so I guess we're, get, we're getting to that time. Marjorie, are you, are you still there? Are you ready to speak? Are you quelling, as they say? Yeah, I've just, uh, just unmuted myself. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. So can you hear me now? Yep. Uh, okay, I, I would love to say some things, but I'm so overwhelmed emotionally. I don't think I can. It's a, I'm so touched by this. I, uh, it's been absolutely wonderful to see so many colleagues and friends that I really adore. And it's just a, a real joy to see you together and to, to see you again. And uh, thank you for your kind words. And it's been a wonderful, I think, um, presentation of what the intelligence has been from its beginning and can be in its future. And this is, these are the questions that my wonderful successors will be grappling with is what is the future of, of, a, of the journal and what is the future of the mathematical community and how can intelligence continue to play an increasingly um, useful and, and constructive role in it. And I, they're the best people to do it. And Mark, I thank you for your con, you know, consistent support and um, I'm just very grateful to everybody and I wish I could be more eloquent at this time because it calls for that, but I'm just really so touched and thank you. You're welcome. It's been a great ride and it's gonna continue. <laughs> um, Marjorie, would Stan wanna say something? I didn't wanna exclude him. If, Here he if is. You wanna, you wanna say anything? Well, I will say that it's I been, can't see you, honey. it's all right. Ah, there you uh, go. <laughs> it has been an utter privilege to have Marjorie as my wife and uh, <laughs> she is beyond words amazing. And she's been a fantastic editor of the journal. And thank you. <laughs> thank you, Stan. All right. Um, all right, so we have come to the end of our conference. Um, and again, thank you for all the guests, for all the participants, for all the speakers. Um, and again, thank you, Karen and Sergey for co-hosting this. Uh, so I think we got to raise a glass to this incredible lady um, <laughs> and send her away with a toast and warm wishes. Uh, for a great future ahead and continuing to contribute to mathematical communities worldwide and the mathematical community of the intelligencer. Thank you, Marjorie. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Marjorie. To Marjorie. <laughs> to you, Marjorie. <laughs> Thank you, Marjorie. Thank you. Thank you, Marjorie. We love you. Thank you, Marjorie. Uh, Tanya, hi. Thanks, Marjorie, and hi. congratulations. Thank you, Marjorie. Thank you. Thanks, Marjorie. Congratulations, Marjorie. Thank you all. Marjorie. Thanks, Marjorie. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, and. <laughs> we'll see everyone in the future and hopefully we can all be together in person <laughs> soon. <laughs> Take care everyone and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. David David Rowe. I'm the one that said Mazel Tov. <laughs> <laughs> Who said it? David Cohen. <laughs> right. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Care, Thank bye you, bye. Mark. Good luck to you. Don, hi. Hi. <laughs>